Hello world. Many of you have followed the film Great Pyramid K 2019 in France. The French version was released on YouTube on December 4th, 2019. Here finally is in the English version. I owe a very special thanks to my team co-producer, Mr. Benoit Brar, Mrs. Old Savilla and Mrs. Fatima Marion, who accompanied me in the producing of this film. I would like to express my deep gratitude to Daniel Scott Arm for translating the film in English. A special thanks is due to all donors for their support and for their kind message. Their name figure in the end credit of the film. Since the film was released, several public debates with French historian and archaeologists have aired on the internet in which I develop various key subjects in more depth and detail. The production of Great Pyramid K 2019 film costs a lot of time and money. Six years every day with a very small team. I did not receive any outside financial assistance. I financed the entire production with my co-producer. So, I decided to create a crowdfund to support the film and to cover the cost of its production. Either way, you found all the movie you watch. You pay without knowing what is waiting for you. Well, here will be no surprise and you will not be disappointed with this one. If you like the film, you are invited to participate in the co-fund in order to continue this work and subsequently carry version in different language. For official traduction in other language, please contact us at the address below. Today we are in 2020. Why then K 2019? Because the year 2019 marked the beginning of the new history of mankind with the world premiere of this documentary film. The film has been shown in a few cinema in Paris, Lyon and Marseille. The first screening was held on September 28, 2019 at the Club de l'Etoile in Paris. It was important for the audience to understand that Great Pyramid K 2019, it is not a conspiracy theory film, but rather it is a serious documentary open to everyone. Now, scientists are welcome to share their view on the part of this film and participate to the open debate with me. This film is free and is not monetized on YouTube. I solemnly ask YouTube not to censor or strike the film, even if requests or rewrite or omission arise. If that happens, please contact me beforehand and I will provide the necessary documents. On this aspect, the seriousness and the impartiality of YouTube are engaged. What is the purpose of this film? The film Great Pyramid K 2019 comes from the dawn of time. It comes in peace. This film is dedicated to all of humanity to unite us around this pyramid and move forward together with love, peace and intelligence. This is the message. This is the mission of this pyramid. To be the source of inspiration to meet the challenges waiting for us. Challenges waiting for all of humanity. Now, this movie is yours. Share and talk about this movie. Enjoy the film and see you soon. May love, peace and intelligence reign on this, our one and only planet.
Here is Egypt, Cairo, and the Giza Plateau with three large pyramids, those of Khufu, Khafre, and Menkor. The Pyramid of Khufu was covered with white limestone, which is completely missing today. There are smaller pyramids called satellites, temples of which only ruins remain, and sanctuary tombs called mastabas, and below, the monumental statue of the Sphinx and the Valley Temple. Inside the Great Pyramid, there are two corridors, tunnels, one chamber 30 meters underground, a room in the middle called the Queen's Chamber, an upper room called the King's Chamber, a large inclined gallery, and four shafts which cross the pyramid. But what is exceptional and out of the ordinary? You are at the foot of the pyramid to take a photo. Stop for a moment to think a little. Imagine pushing and pulling a stone this size with 50 other people. Then imagine doing this with a second stone, then a third. You will have to raise them to a height of five meters, then 10, then 20, 40, 80, 120 meters. There are 2,300,000 waiting for you like this that will need to be transported and hoisted. It's dizzying. You look to the top, then to the bottom, and you start to reflect. Immediately the thought comes to mind, the Egyptians were crazy. You then learn that a block of granite weighs 70 tons, the weight of three loaded tractor-trailer trucks. Then you learn that inside there are 1,500 tons of granite that came from 900 kilometers away. A kind of dizziness takes you. You've only just begun to consider the difficulty and you are forced to humbly recognize that the mystery of the pyramids is not exaggerated. Here are the theories. For Egyptologists, it was the Egyptians who built the pyramid, period. They achieved the following feats. They raised and leveled a hill to place the pyramid and a hundred mastabas. From the beginning of the plateau to the end, 250 meters, the base of the pyramids is perfectly horizontal to within 21 millimeters. They dug an 80 meter long tunnel that descends to a depth of 80 meters into the rock which is 1.1 meters wide by one meter high, with an error of only one centimeter from beginning to end. Here is a tunnel of our time. They cut and transported around 130 blocks of granite weighing 12 to 70 tons from Aswan, and they raised them 80 meters high. The pyramid is not built with four sides, but with eight sides in a concave abathem. The pyramid is oriented to the north with an error of 0.05 degrees. According to Egyptologists, the construction lasted about 20 years, meaning one block was cut and transported and installed every three minutes. It is impossible to pass a sheet of paper between the blocks. How does one explain that these blocks weighing several tons were cut with such precision? This was the copper era, and logically the construction had to be carried out with a copper chisel and a stone ball. This is the academic's theory. Let's continue with other prowesses in precision. The downward tunnel forms an angle of 26.2 degrees. This angle is identical in the ascending corridor. A student's protractor does not display the two-tenths of a degree. But the most impressive remains to come with the south underground tunnel and the well shaft 30 meters underground. At first glance, they are ordinary tunnels. The entrance is 79 centimeters high and ends 16 meters further with a difference of only 5 centimeters. It's 75 centimeters wide at one end and 76 centimeters at the other end, a difference of 1 centimeter, an almost perfectly straight line. How does one build this tunnel with such precision underground? The Egyptians went even further in their exploits. The well shaft starts near the underground chamber, rises almost vertically 10 meters, to then continue 26 meters with an angle of 45 degrees, with perfect dimensions, 68 by 68 centimeters. Georges Goyon thinks that the well shaft was dug by thieves, from the bottom to the top, shortly after the funeral. So then thieves would have taken the time to dig a perfectly straight tunnel? 
Gilles Dormion believes, on the contrary, that the tunnel was built by the original builders and that it was dug from the top down. The notches for placing the feet are much too small for a worker to be able to stand a long time without a rope, digging above his head. To dig these three tunnels and the underground chamber, you must solve four problems. You need light, a solution for making precise measurements and hard tools for digging, correct working conditions, and above all, a solution for removing the carbon dioxide. The biggest problem is indeed the CO2. When a worker works, he exhales CO2. This CO2 accumulates at the bottom. After one hour, there are 15 centimeters, two hours later, 30. It is a sure death if he does not go out at once. If this CO2 is not removed, it remains there for several weeks. Here, I will demonstrate how the CO2 flows in the gallery. It stays at the bottom. So, I take a gas that has the same density as CO2. It has the property of being colored, allowing it to be seen, but it's a gas, so we see through it. And so now, we move away a little bit, and I'm going to pour the CO2 here in this jar, and we'll see what happens. And we see that the gas that represents CO2 remains at the bottom of this crystallizer. And that also shows that O2, oxygen, will also fall by gravity to the bottom of the tunnel. In other words, we could not dig a tunnel, with my assumption, from the bottom up, because the oxygen would not go up. A worker will exhale 40 grams of CO2 in one hour. And chemistry explains that 40 grams of CO2 are fixed by 100 grams of limestone. This is 100 grams of limestone. In this experiment, I want to show that CO2, which is in the atmosphere of this beaker, is fixed by limestone, that is, limestone chalk. I put a little powder here in the water, which is there, which I will shake in a moment. This is just a level that allows you to see if there is CO2 consumption in the air. So, I set the level to zero, and here we go. I put the chalk in. And now when I agitate, we will look at the index here. We see that the index shows that there is CO2 which is fixed by limestone. Limestone has the property of fixing CO2 when it is wet. And that's a rather simple explanation, because there is water present, or we can bring it. And then the limestone, which was excavated, is raised to the surface with the CO2 which was fixed to it. Suppose they solved, one doesn't know how, the problem of light, the tool to measure precisely, and the hard tool for digging, that they have found the way to evacuate the CO2. The problem remains that it is technically impossible to dig towards the bottom. It would take an arm two meters long to reach the bottom. If one can provide some theories on the construction of the pyramids and on the way the stones were raised to 80 and 140 meters, here there is no explanation. We're totally in the dark, and it doesn't stop there. Here is the Part Dieu Tower in Lyon, nicknamed the Crayon, a tower that ends with a pyramid on top. The last floor is 144 meters high, equivalent to the height of Khufu Pyramid. The two shafts of the middle chamber arrive 80.72 meters for one and 80.73 meters for the other, an error of one centimeter over a total distance of 100 meters. How did the Egyptians achieve such precision? With this? The official theory says that these four shafts are conduits to guide the soul of the king. For others, they are air shafts, or star target shafts, or even shafts to fill with water. Okay, but these shafts are sealed shut, and those in the middle chamber were sealed on both sides until 1872. Yet Egyptologists insist. In 2013, at the edge of the Red Sea, a papyrus was discovered. Merer's Papyrus, the captain's diary, which dates from the time of Khufu. It is the oldest papyrus ever discovered. A documentary film was produced and broadcast on television. This film is an interpretation, fictional and far from being scientific reality. In the film, in theory, the workers quarry the block with copper pickaxes. In truth, the extras in the film detach the stone with steel pickaxes, 
With copper pickaxes, it would require 10 years of effort for this block to come off. Finally, they detach a three-ton block. In this papyrus, there is no mention of the size of the stone transported by Merer. It could weigh 10 kilograms or 10 tons. Three tons is a very small stone in Egypt. The boat, reconstructed with care and fidelity, almost sank with the block. Even removing one ton, the boat struggled to bear the weight. It risked capsizing at any time. How do you transport this stone, which weighs 10 tons, from the original quarry site? With which boat? Later, the film shows 40 men struggling to pull the stone weighing 2 tons from the port to the site. How then did they get the granite stone from the king's chamber, which weighs 70 tons, and lift it 50 meters high? The only ancient testimony about the construction of the pyramid is that of Herodotus, who was born 2,000 years later. Herodotus heard this story told by the Egyptian priests in Memphis during his trip to Egypt. Herodotus explains that the stones were hoisted with cranes. Thus, many Egyptologists offer their theories based on the story of Herodotus. And since the blocks are very heavy, the most logical solutions are ramps and cranes. Dozens of models of ramps. Each Egyptologist invents a ramp. Here is the spiral ramp of George Goyon, the ramp of Borchardt, and Jean-Pierre Adams' ramp. The problem is that among all these theories, none has been tested in real life. That is to say, for example, not even a simple trial of hoisting at least two stones 10 meters high. Besides, one still doesn't know where the quarry that supplied the interior stones is located. From there, there, or there. In a documentary, the architect Jean-Pierre Houdin, in collaboration with the Salt Systems Laboratories, develops a theory, and like so many others, still offers a ramp. Here, the ramp is as monumental as the pyramid itself. This ramp is copied in the Hollywood film 10,000 BC. Hollywood also adds mammoths. One sees nasty Egyptians mistreating mammoths, pulling blocks of stones. Of course, no traces of mammoths or of the ramp were ever found. The ramp alone is a monumental work whose dismantling should have left traces. This site, as seen by Jean-Pierre Houdin, would require hundreds of thousands of workers. In his 3D animation of the documentary, one can see that the Egyptians are struggling to hoist and lay the stones every three minutes. And there are other inconsistencies in this theory. 600 men pull a 60-ton block of granite, the equivalent of 100 kilograms per person. 50 kilograms per person is more realistic, therefore 1,200 men would be necessary to pull this block. Otherwise, the workers would collapse. And if indeed they can transport a 60-ton block, how would they do with this 360-ton block of Aswan granite? How many people are needed? 7,200 men? Jean-Pierre Adam, another Egyptologist, takes the absurdity even further. These are the oxen who pulled the stone block, and I suppose this monolith too. This is just the base of the statue of Ramses. The theories imply one must also bring this monolith from the other side of the Nile, 200 kilometers away. With which boat? And as if 360 tons is not enough, there is also the Aswan obelisk, 1,200 tons of granite, which awaits them. Here's the kind of crane and how many it would take to lift it. According to Jean-Pierre Adam, it would take 12,000 men or eight to 9,000 oxen. It is no longer fiction, but science fiction or a cartoon, however you like. Personally, I prefer the theory of the aliens who would have transported them thanks to their superior technology. The Egyptologists reassure us with a dubious explanation. After all the hard work to cut this obelisk, the workers realized that it was too heavy and it was cracked, so they just left it. Well, 1,200 tons of granite is still not enough. We come to the Pyramid of Menkor, whose exterior was covered with the staggering quantity of 103,000 tons of granite. Just printing millions of books showing workers dragging stones does not mean that it is a scientific reality or the truth. There is a problem with the granite. In 1920, the Egyptologist Engelbach published a book on the Aswan obelisk. Finding no trace of pickaxe or chisel on the obelisk, 
He theorized that the dolerite balls that were all around were the tools used. Egyptologists have since approved and adopted this idea. Egyptologists have a lot of humor and finesse. Whenever they find an object next to a monument, they claim that it is the tool used to create it. What would have to say if they had found a spoon? Without having too much knowledge in physics, we know that two materials with the same property will repel each other. When you hit granite, the dolerite ball bounces. So, if you were wondering what type of tool was able to carve such a big obelisk in granite, well, I have the answer for all of you little curious minds. Here are the tools. Listen, it seemed absurd to me too when I was told that, but the tools they used were only balls of a stone called dolerite, which form, my God, it is hot, which form naturally in the region. They weigh on average five kilos. And the method is relatively simple. You take a ball, you hit like a lunatic on the granite, and you see what happens. Following experiments, it was estimated that it was possible to wear away five millimeters of the surface of the granite in one hour. That's enough to tell you that you must have good arms, and especially a lot of patience. Okay, I'll give you a little demo, because after all, it is not very complicated. So, to be completely honest, well, this is not my first try. There, I did it 10 seconds to show you, but I have already come here. I have already tried for a longer time. I am not entirely convinced by the tools, because we're here just having fun, tapping. We see after 10 strokes, we have uh, just scratched the granite. But the thing is that with this ball, they did that behind. 40 meters long and 1,200 tons, voila! Granite is one of the hardest stones on Earth. Seven out of 10 on the Mohs scale of mineral hardness. Nowadays, granite is only cut using a diamond tooth saw, cooled with water and in a straight line. In official documentaries, we are shown experiments where granite is cut with a copper saw and sand. They managed to cut in a straight line and take out a cylindrical core. Everything can be explained with words, but how do you cut this gabbro vase, a material even harder than granite, in 3500 BC? Or this tracheandesite vase? No fewer than 35,000 vases like these have been found in Saqqara. How in 1800 BC does one achieve these curves in the statue of Senyusret, made of migmatite, stone of hardness seven, or that of the statue of Menkor and her princesses in gray wax, which is harder than granite? And this nice vase only three millimeters thick, or the famous Sabu disc made of schist. What is this extraordinary tool that cuts granite like butter? Or maybe 4,500 years ago, granite was soft like clay. These observations pose fundamental problems. We are told that the limestone rafters are vaulted to distribute weight. Why then is the ceiling of the underground chamber not vaulted? However, it must support all this rock mass in addition to the pyramid itself. Is that science? In the absence of a rational and coherent explanation, today we have all kinds of theories ranging from perplexing to surreal and still without proof. This is the case with this documentary and many others. The documentary suggests that either extraterrestrials built the pyramids or a lost civilization, the Atlanteans, or both together, hand in hand. The Atlanteans lived on Earth and had assimilated great technological knowledge. Following abrupt climate change or a natural disaster, they and Atlantis disappeared 10,000 years ago without a trace. In short, the only traces they left were the pyramids. Then the Egyptians arrived, found them very beautiful, and decided to maintain them. This is what Graham Hancock and many others think.
A very logical theory, since to cut granite, you need a machine like this. Which means you need electricity, a power plant, steel machinery, engineers, schools, and universities. In short, 5,000 years of technical and scientific evolution. Concerning the construction of the pyramids, they do not advance any scientific explanation. They unanimously agree these are not tombs. According to them, the Atlanteans or some other unknown ancient builders cut these stones with machines and then built whatever they wanted. Then they left these machines to the Egyptians, who used them to make statues and to engrave battles, marriages, births, etc. in hieroglyphics. Finally, the Egyptians destroyed all these tools without leaving a trace. After building the pyramids, the Atlanteans entrusted cleaning and maintenance to the Egyptians. Some believe that the pyramid was a hydraulic instrument, but we do not know for what purpose. For others, the pyramid is a receiver transmitter to connect with other worlds in the universe, and the sarcophagus a device to lengthen life. Lie down in the sarcophagus a few hours and recharge yourself for a hundred more years. For Chris Dunn, the pyramid of Khufu is an energy plant using waves and magnetic resonances, anti-gravitational systems, affirmations supported with numerous conferences, presentations, and trips throughout the world. In this nebulous realm, the artists also have their say, further thickening the mystery. But the aliens and the Atlanteans left no traces or materials. No iron, no steel, no crystal, no plastic, no metals or composite materials. Only stones, strange, isn't it? We are still waiting to see the aliens on the evening news of the major channels filmed in HD. At present, there is no evidence of ultra-developed civilization or aliens before the Egyptians. In short, an incredible mixture. We are lost in confusion. One more for the road. If we divide the width of the pyramid by half the height, we get pi, 3.14. The golden ratio and pi are also found in the king's chamber. The facts are there, and anyone can verify them on site or with official documents. These two figures and many others are universal constants. Universal constants are the insurmountable borders of our reality, kind of like the rules of a game. Officially, Pi was discovered by Archimedes around 287 BC. It's just a coincidence, cry Egyptologists. It's intentional, insists Jacques Grimaud. Rainer Stadelman found a pyramidion in Dakor, which measures 100 centimeters high. The Egyptologists are unanimous. It is by chance there too. The metric unit was found in the Great Pyramid, especially in the upper chamber. In 1952, Dr. Frank Hellet published a proposal that the Great Pyramid, which had an upper chamber, which was a double square on the floor, had a perimeter of 60 cubits, or 10 times the number pi, in meters. This is the first time the metric unit was proposed as a measure used by the Egyptians in addition to the royal cubit. Everyone is in total agreement. No horse, wood was scarce, no wheel, no iron, no math. To sum it up, Egypt was in the post-primitive stage. Humans just came out of the Stone Age, and they started building phenomenal pyramids with mathematical properties, not one, but a hundred. Complex pyramids with no credible explanation for their construction. Gigantic granite obelisks in one piece with hieroglyphics perfectly engraved imposing temples, complexly designed walls, breathtaking pottery made of diorite, basalt, granite, impossible to cut with the most sophisticated machines. Monumental statues in granite, quartz, shale, the hardest materials, high-level mathematics and geometry, as if by chance. So, who built them and how? Egyptians, aliens, Atlanteans, aliens in cooperation with humans, is there a linear and gradual evolution of humanity, or a zigzag? Who wins the grand prize? One question, two answers. How do you build a pyramid? If you know how, you know who. When we look for the truth, sometimes we take a big detour, and in the end we realize that it was right next door. Instead of looking to the heavens, staring at the stars and imagining aliens, we just had to look down right under our feet, on the ground. This is what Joseph Davidovitz did, a largely overlooked mineralogist and Egyptologist. In fact, it is a matter of chemistry and minerals. Here is a simple wooden mold. 
we mix flaky limestone with white clay called kaolin. Caustic soda is dissolved in water. We mix everything together with a little water. This gives a kind of paste. We pour it into the mold. A few hours later, the paste begins to harden. The minerals bind together thanks to the chemical reaction, which after 30 days gives a real white stone, hard as the covering stones of the pyramid. It is the first concrete of humanity. Today, concrete is a common material, ordinary, but at that time, this mixture was noble and expensive. Sodium carbonate comes from Natron, a region of Egypt, hence the symbol in chemistry of sodium Na for natron. Burnt lime is made by heating limestone. When you mix the burnt lime with the sodium carbonate, caustic soda is produced. Kaolin clay is naturally present in limestone in Egypt. This clay limestone is abundant. There are millions of cubic meters. The components are mixed with water and poured into wooden molds. This is how the Egyptians made all the stones. Joseph Davidovitz made this discovery in 1989. At the time, he assumed that the stones were molded and poured on site and not cut. He called this process geopolymer. The principle is the same as that of concrete today. Modern cement is made of clay heated at 1,450 degrees Celsius, mixed with water and gravel, producing concrete. The ancients used natron and burnt lime instead of modern cement. This mixture of natron, burnt lime, clay and limestone at room temperature and in the open air gives the same result as modern concrete. This is geopolymer concrete. The proof is everywhere, in thousands of examples. The rhomboid pyramid seems to come out of a mold. The quality of the concrete is excellent. Davidovitz interprets the texts of the Colossi of Memnon differently from the official interpretation. He thinks they mean the concrete was mixed like dough, not the poetic version. They were made like bread, full of love. Indeed, the material is a very complex chemical mixture of siliceous paste. Joseph Davidovitz's theory was refuted and relegated to the background for lack of scientific evidence. Years later, he brought the evidence with chemical analyses. Even with very detailed analyses, the chemical difference between a poured stone, artificial, and a natural stone is almost imperceptible. The result is the same, and it is for this reason that geologists saw nothing. He continued the debate, but Egyptologists are still not convinced, or rather, they don't want to be convinced. In 2006, the Egyptian government made an official statement, the stones are not concrete, case officially closed. But a simple statement cannot physically transform the pyramid from concrete to cut stones. Davidovitz provides paleomagnetic analysis results. Every stone in nature at the time of its formation is magnetized by the Earth. That is, each stone has a north, like a compass. All the stones of the pyramid have the same magnetic north, not random. These are chemical analyses carried out under a microscope by Davidovitz. Evidence, but they are not enough to convince the public. Do we have other, more convincing evidence apart from chemical and X-ray analyses? So here is a natural stone found everywhere in nature, and here is a piece of wood. In nature, we always find the wood that grow next to the stone. And here is the proof. And here is a stone that I poured with the formula of Joseph Davidovitz. And before the sun dried, I inserted a piece of wood, and this piece of wood, it will stay stuck indefinitely. In the pyramid of Medum, 70 kilometers below the Giza Plateau and the Great Pyramid, in the heart of the pyramid, there is a stone weighing around two tons. And inside this stone, there is a piece of wood, which it is embedded for eternity. This piece of wood has been there for 4,500 years. 
But maybe the Egyptians simply dug a hole and inlaid the beam. No, it is not possible because the stone perfectly meets the beam. Between the stone and the wood there is no mortar. Between the stone and the piece of wood there is no space, not even to insert a pin. Of course, you shouldn't just rely on a photo. We went to the Medum Pyramid. The history of Egypt hangs on this beam. Ah. Anyone can go there, see it, and touch it. When you know how to pour a stone like concrete, you will do a second, a third, you will do tens, hundred thousand, million of blocks, and in so doing, you can build a whole pyramid. The huge stones of the Pyramid of Khafre are made on site with limestone concrete poured into long molds. It is inconceivable to transport this stone. Do you know how many stones of this size there are? Hundreds. It is unimaginable that they were transported and cut. They were cast as well. In the temple of the Valley of Khafre, there are limestone blocks weighing 300 to 400 tons. The Menkor Pyramid Chamber is made of a single block weighing about 600 tons. One can clearly see the location of the construction beams left when the concrete was still fresh. By the way, what is this piece of wood doing in the stone? And the most prodigious of all is the wall surrounding the Pyramid of Khafre. This wall is a perfect 90 degree square made of single blocks weighing 500 to 1,000 tons or more. It is eight meters high, six meters wide, and 60 meters long. Two solutions, either the Egyptians cut the hill but then, one needs to show how it was possible to cut a hill to a height of 8 meters. Or, the wall is simply poured concrete. This brings us back to Medum. If the Egyptians were able to build a pyramid with concrete, it is therefore logical that they could pour a large wall, like all the other buildings in Egypt. Joseph Davidovitz, helped by 10 participants, poured four blocks weighing two tons in two weeks. When you have a malleable material that hardens quickly, you can make what you want with it. Pyramids, temples, statues, obelisks, sarcophagus, or vases. Indeed, it is simple. You must understand that to build a pyramid 140 meters high, you need a stone on the ground with a minimum resistance of 15 megapascals, the ABCs of engineering and architecture. This block has a resistance of 25 to 40 megapascals. So scientifically, this stone can support 500 identical blocks without collapsing. The pyramid being 140 meters high, there is more than enough resistance. After many trials and experiments, the Egyptians had acquired the technique they used for the first pyramid of Djoser, built 180 years earlier. The construction of the pyramid started four years ago.
We are at ground level. The mold for the first cornerstone is in place. Arranged in Indian file, I mean in African file, the workers pass the buckets one after the other from the mixing tank to the mold. They pour the white concrete and about 30 minutes later the mold is filled. Today we call this process formwork construction. But let's go back a few years. A little further, when the Egyptians settled on the banks of the Nile. Long before they discovered a numbering system, they started from the simple principle of one to 10 by counting their fingers. Then they counted their toes, plus 10, and thereby appropriated the numbering system of 10 by 10 by 10. It is the same system that we use today. After language, numbering is the second thing humanity learned, long before writing. The numbering system by 10 is for humans the first gateway to scientific understanding of the environment. It is a kind of bridge between the primitive mind and intelligence. The Egyptians observed that the year is made of 365 days plus one. They cut it into three seasons, four months each, for a total of 12 months. The seasons were called flood, germination, and harvest. Over the years, they observed a strange phenomenon. Each year in summer, on a specific day, July 14th, a star, the brightest, rose with the sun, and a few minutes later, it disappeared into the light. The same day, the Nile flooded the fields. The floods were fertile, essential to life, to produce food. Egyptians deified this star and called it Sopdet or Septi. It was the star that announced the floods of the Nile. Today, we call it Sirius. This phenomenon is called the heliacal rising of Sirius. It was the first day of the Egyptian year, followed by five holidays. The Nile brought the essential silt for the crops. It is for this reason that this star was sacred to them. The land was flooded for three to four consecutive months. Work in the fields stopped and during this time the Egyptians went up into the hills to be on dry land. Well, it was the start of three months of vacation. And it was like that year after year for thousands of years. This episode is hidden and is not explained by Egyptologists. They don't speak at all about floods of the Nile. An innocent mind immediately wonders, but what did they do for three or four months if they couldn't cultivate the fields? The Egyptians did three things during these three to four months of vacation. Observe, measure, and note everything. As soon as the Nile returned to its bed, a big problem had arisen. Field limits had disappeared. It was then necessary to retrace the limits of the fields of each peasant and start sowing as soon as possible. And they had to be traced correctly to avoid disputes. Therefore, the Egyptians began to draw straight lines, rectangles, squares, diagonals, circles, and triangles with strings and sticks. Everything was noted on papyrus. It was the beginning of geometry. They understood a fundamental function of nature. Everything is divided or assembled in small equal units. This observation will serve them throughout their discoveries. They also needed a unit of measure to properly demarcate the plots. Geometry is good, but after all, you must measure the lines. They considered the king's foot. The length of the king's foot could be used as a standard. This standard would be multiplied and distributed throughout the kingdom. They considered the feet, arms, legs, and elbows of the king, but there was a problem. This unit was not fixed. There would be no problem during his reign, but all the kings were not the same size. The next king would surely want to use his foot or his elbow out of pride. 
In the hills, waiting for the retreat of the Nile, the Egyptians thought and looked for a solution to the problem. This unit of measurement would have to have a fixed length in time, if possible, never change. They observed the size of different plants, fruits, seeds, any object in nature. But all these objects did not have a constant size. For example, if we water a seed well, the following year its size will have changed. And over long distances, small differences quickly became significant. Then, they had the idea to measure water. Yes, fresh water from the Nile. They measured one drop and then another. They were all the same size. From the lower Nile to the upper Nile, the drops were the same size. They noticed that the size of the water drop did not change year after year. It's wonderful. The Egyptians found a unique unit. The diameter of the drop of water on a waterproof surface, like granite or alabaster, is constant. It measures one centimeter. Today, an incredible video in which you will dive into the heart of the first stage of the Serapium project. Ula, 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 ula. So this is the stop M on the diagram. I don't know if the Egyptians knew the meter or not. I don't know at all. You even checked the measurement? You measured it two times? I double every measure every time. Okay, so one meter. 1.000 meters. Precisely one meter measured by laser twice in a row. They named this small unit the royal finger. Ten drops of water or ten royal fingers equals one royal hand. One hundred drops of water, so one hundred royal fingers or ten royal hands, equals one royal leg. Centuries later, these discoveries were taken out of secret coffers and renamed. The royal finger was called the centimeter, the royal hand the decimeter, and the royal leg the meter. They were presented as recent discoveries and the French appropriated them made in France. The diameter of the drop of fresh water measures what is now called one centimeter. Water is a universal constant. The size of the drop of fresh water will never change for thousands and millions of years. Yes, the universal unit, the meter, was not invented in 1780, but it was discovered by the Egyptians millennia ago. The meter is a universal unit because it is measured on water. Water is the only material that is stable. All other materials or objects are difficult to measure or else they vary over time. The architecture of the entire universe is constructed with this unit. Using the meter, this immutable unit, were defined the six fundamental units of physics and chemistry today. Amperes, Celsius, moles, candelas, seconds, and kilograms. So, everything. Now that the Egyptians had discovered the meter, they could trace the plots without a problem. With the meter, they measured everything and recorded everything. They took a disc with the diameter of a royal leg and wrapped a string around it. They unrolled the string and measured it. The parameter of the disc was three royal legs and 14 royal fingers, or 314 royal fingers. A disc with a diameter of 10 unrolled corresponded to 31 units and four subunits. A disc with a diameter of one corresponded to three units and to 14 subunits. One number stood out each time, 314, 31.4, 3.14, they thought this number was important. This figure is pi, 3.14. Egyptians knew pi with precision long before Archimedes. From this experience, they also deduced the decimal system. 
They cut the disc into six, measured it on the royal leg, the meter. They got the number 52 centimeters and 36 subunits, millimeters. They wrote it down and thought this was important. During their observations, they noted that the volume of a sphere represents 52.36% the volume of a cube. Whenever the volume of the cube and the sphere increases proportionally, this number does not vary. In so doing, they discovered one of the most important universal constants, kept secret, the number 52.36. Twice, in volumes and forms, this number is everywhere. They conclude that this number is sacred. The Egyptians discovered the number 52.36, which is a universal constant like pi and phi. The number 52.36 is an important universal constant, more than pi and the golden ratio, since it connects 2D space with that of 3D. Now, how does one incorporate this sacred number? They put a stick on the royal leg, the meter, which is divided into 100 units. They cut the stick so that it made 52 royal fingers and 36 subunits. The royal cubit was born. The royal cubit equals 52.36 drops of water, or 52.36 centimeters. From then on, all of Egypt would have as a standard a universal constant, the royal cubit. The Egyptian royal cubit as presented in museums, 28 fingers or 7 palms, is incomprehensible. It is disguised so that the people do not understand the origin of this cubit. It doesn't matter who disguised the cubit, but when you put it on a meter, it displays 52 centimeters, 30 millimeters, and 6 tenths of a millimeter. It becomes a universal constant. It takes on all its meaning. They invented another measure, half the meter minus 5 millimeters, called the Babylonian royal cubit. They used these two standards, and the meter was deliberately hidden. It is for this reason that we find the meter everywhere in the Great Pyramid, since the royal cubit is graduated on the meter. Any other unit, the yard, the inch, the mile, the nautical mile, the pica, the foot, are all arbitrary or graduated on the meter. There is nothing universal or unchanging in nature that measures one inch, one yard, or a mile. The whole number eight is divided by pi. The result, 2.54, will be graduated to the meter. The Imperial System Unit is born. Empirically, the Egyptians also discovered the Golden Ratio. They reasoned thus, since the gods use these sacred figures everywhere in nature, in order to remain connected to nature ourselves, we must integrate them into our buildings to do as the gods do. Simple reasoning, but genius. Sacred principles. The Egyptians will integrate the universal constants everywhere. Pi, the golden ratio, the royal cubit, the whole panoply of sacred geometry with the meter. The Egyptians knew the Fibonacci sequence in the golden number thousands of years before him and called it the addition sequence. The Temple of Khafre, the Temple of Edfu, Akhenaten's palaces are built with the golden rectangle. Here is a parade of the Fibonacci sequence 3,700 years ago.
This is the truth, far from the image of the primitive Egyptians who were dragging stones and hitting stones together all day long. At this point, the Egyptians thought that they could use water as a weight standard. They weighed a container of 10 royal fingers filled with water and then assigned a weight on a scale. Do you know how much it is? Today, it is called one kilogram. They could now weigh and measure without a problem. A drop of water measures one centimeter and a 10 centimeter cube weighs one kilo. These measures will not change for millions of years. Yes, the mass standard also comes from the Egyptians. Imperial and American units of mass, such as pound, ounce, and long ton, volume units like gallon or pint, are arbitrary or graduated to the meter. The only universal and unchanging measure is the kilogram, which itself flows from the meter. The centimeter, indexed to the diameter of the drop of water, is a universal and unchanging measure for millions of years. Throughout their history, Egyptians used two units at the same time, the cubit and the meter. It doesn't matter who has hidden these standards over the centuries, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, or the French. One thing is certain, since the time that they were discovered by the Egyptians, they have been discreetly transmitted and they have been well preserved. We also find the use of metric units on monuments that are more recent. For example, 12th century Roman churches, now, when we study the dimensions of these monuments, one realizes that the metric unit could have been used. I took measurements and I did a statistical treatment of the data. I could see that on these monuments of the 12th century, that the metric unit was used, but also the Egyptian royal cubit. I measured the Roman church of saint Nectaire. I could see that the entrance is double, of which the first entrance is three meters wide, and whole number in meters. And the entrance, which is just behind, measures four royal cubits wide. And the length of this large Roman church is exactly 40 meters. On the church of Conch, on one of the walls, there is a stone totally different from the others. It is a stone which is much larger, which you notice immediately when you arrive. And this stone is exactly one meter wide. Around 2650 BC, a scientist from the court of King Djoser, called Imhotep, mixed various materials, natron, lime, limestone, and discovered that this mixture hardens after a few days and looks like a natural stone. He improved the formula and built the first pyramid of Egypt, the Step Pyramid of Djoser. Imhotep certainly used several concrete formulas, that's why we find stones of different compositions in this pyramid. With experience, the Egyptians built ever more beautiful and more captivating pyramids up to the reign of Khufu. We are now in 2560 BC. First, it is necessary to select the construction site. They examine the Giza Plateau. Then, they measure the quantity of clay limestone. Depending on the volume of the limestone, they determine the size of the pyramid. Here in Giza, there is white and dark clay limestone. The plan is to make a pyramid with dark limestone for the interior and white limestone for the exterior. Above the present hill, there was soft clay limestone about 11 meters thick, which made a hill 30 meters high at the time. Here is how high the soft limestone wall was at the time. 11 meters of clay limestone represents approximately 7 to 8 million cubic meters, which is more than enough to build three pyramids with mastabas all around. The volume of the Great Pyramid is only 2.6 million cubic meters. That's what this represented seen from the side. It is almost imperceptible seen from far away. At the location of the tunnels and the underground chamber, there was a cavity about 30 meters. 
The place is chosen. It will be the Giza Plateau. Before starting the pyramid, the Egyptians established a model. Here are examples of models, a miniature limestone model of the apartments of the Hawara Pyramid. The construction of this monument absolutely required a careful preliminary plan. The architecture of the pyramid was determined based on a very precise and detailed plan. Everything that was thought of from the start was carried out and scrupulously respected. To build a pyramid, you must choose the shape of the triangle. The question is, what triangle? This is a triangle. This one too. There is a choice from 230,000 triangles and 110 million possibilities to make a pyramid. But the Egyptians chose only one, the only one, the perfect one. According to their sacred principles, they laid a base that measures 440 cubits. Then they divided the base by pi, or 140 cubits. That, multiplied by two, equals 280 cubits. The result is the height of the pyramid and the apothem divided by half the base equals 1.618. The Egyptians absolutely wanted to integrate the constants pi and the golden ratio. The pyramid became sacred since it was built with the cubit 52.36, the royal constant, and the meter. Four universal constants were linked together in this building. There was no such thing as chance. 50 centimeters more or less, and pi disappeared from the pyramid. The Egyptologists would have been relieved. Phew, there is no pi. But no, the Egyptians did not make any mistakes. They built a pyramid 280 cubits high and 440 cubits wide. The pyramid is exceptionally precise to within one centimeter, which shows the pi value very precisely. The Great Pyramid is the largest man-made expression of pi and the golden ratio visible on Earth. Khufu's son Khafre chose another concept for his pyramid. That of the sacred triangle, 3, 4, 5, in symmetry, the Pythagorean triangle. By the way, it would seem that Pythagoras never existed. Here is the plan as it was drawn at the time. The large cavity was fitted with limestone concrete to make the underground chamber. From the ground level to the underground chamber, the height is 56 cubits. From the floor to the middle chamber, the height is also 56 cubits. Then each space is cut in half and in quarters. The angle of the descending and ascending corridors is the diagonal of the two squares. From the underground chamber to the intersection, there are 161 cubits. From the intersection to the ascending corridor made with the same mold, there are also 161 cubits. The architect also planned the three plugs used to close the entrance and a secret well shaft to go out. The middle chamber is in the middle and coated with white limestone. The king's chamber is in red Aswan granite and on five levels. The four shafts, precise to the centimeter, target the sacred stars. The position of the sun ray at noon on July 14th, the day of Sirius's rising, determined the location of the king's chamber. Ray and the king were to be reunited in the chamber. The Egyptians divided the pyramid up like plots of fields, and in accordance with their principles, they integrated the sacred numbers into their monuments. From the construction of the underground chamber until the end of the construction, the Egyptians recorded the height measurements precisely and meticulously. These precise height readings, row by row, to the nearest centimeter, served them throughout construction. Once the plan was completed and the dimensions decided, they calculated the volumes. They had to determine if there was enough limestone on site to complete the Great Pyramid and the monuments around. The Egyptians knew that such a pyramid required 2.6 million cubic meters of limestone. Before starting such a monument, they had to make sure there was enough material to finish it, at the risk of ending up with a truncated pyramid. Egyptians therefore knew how to calculate volume long before the Rhind and Moscow papyrus, dating earlier than 1600 BC. You cannot make concrete without having standard measurements of volume and mass. Following careful field inspections, the volume was calculated before the work was started. Hemi Unu further perfected the pyramid by converting it into a concave apothem. The drawing of the pyramid today is precisely the starting blueprint. Nothing, absolutely nothing was changed during construction. Thank you.
At the time of construction, the Nile floods arrived at the foot of the hill. Water was essential for mixing and needed to be close at hand. It is for this reason that all the pyramids were built by the river. Making concrete and grinding limestone required a lot of water, about 20% of the total volume. Here is what it represents in relation to the pyramid. 500,000 cubic meters. How does one raise all this water up from below? The Egyptians invented the screw pump, or so-called Archimedes screw. Some historians believe that this method was known in Babylon, 400 years before Archimedes. It was known thousands of years earlier by the Egyptians. The Egyptians dug three passages, passages about 10 meters wide. It is easy to dig in soft limestone. In order to route the water and send it to the other side, they installed wooden viaducts in these passages. The cavity was then filled with limestone concrete. The Egyptians had known the equinoxes for a long time. The date is April 13th, 2560 BC, the time six hours, three minutes. The vernal equinox, the sun will rise in a few minutes precisely east. A team is in place with sticks and ropes to be able to align with the sun. They await the first rays. The sun is rising. Three or four Egyptians quickly arrange the sticks and ropes. Five minutes later, the sun moves, but the first four sticks are aligned to the east. This configuration of 90 and 180 degrees is projected at the bottom of the cavity. The Egyptians had experience with this precision, which they had used in the fields at the banks of the Nile for hundreds of years. The edges of the cavity are transformed into a shallow basin, where the limestone clay, natron, and lime are mixed. Once the mixture is obtained, they open the valves and let the concrete flow to the bottom of the cavity. Indeed, they filled these natural bowls to then make the underground tunnels. Limestone concrete, once dried, takes on a natural rock appearance. That's why geologists haven't noticed. No trace of fire was found in the underground chamber. This explains why the concrete was made outdoors. The Egyptians brought back natron salt, sodium carbonate from Natron Valley or from the surroundings to make caustic soda. Lime was produced on site by heating limestone 100 meters from the site. It is July 14th, 2561 BC. Everything is ready. The Egyptians wait for the Nile floods to start. The site is divided into four teams. A hundred workers are waiting near the screw pumps to draw the water up. The other teams are waiting by the pools to mix the materials and just as many others are at the bottom of the cavity. Sirius rises. A few hours later, the Nile overflows and reaches the foot of the hill. The workers begin to turn the screw pumps. The water rises and flows to the other side. They mix dark brown limestone with natron and lime. A few moments later, they open the valves and the concrete pours from the edge of the bowl. The workers have already measured and set up the mold at the bottom of the bowl, which will create the south underground tunnel. The concrete just has to flow around it. They will use the same principle for the underground chamber. 
The mold has been put in place and the concrete was poured around and over it. Workers took less care for the walls of the underground chamber than for the top of the pyramid. This concrete contains much less water than that of the upper part of the pyramid. When the mold is removed quickly and it has not had time to dry, it gives this rough appearance. The Egyptians never dug underground chambers or corridors below the pyramids since it's impossible. They simply filled it in. May the archaeologist Mark Lerner rest assured, the workers did not suffer. They worked in the open air and in good conditions, as was the case for the unfinished pyramid of Jedefre. The cavity was then filled with limestone concrete. This explains the high precision of the South Underground Tunnel, the service tunnel, but also the sharp edges of the tunnel in this photo of Edgar Weiss in 1910. To validate this theory, one simply needs to take a sample of the walls of the underground and do a chemical analysis. The Egyptians used the same method to build the descending tunnel and the well shaft. They established a formwork structure like this. The diagonal of two squares, which gives an angle of 26.57 degrees, which will also be used for the tunnel. This same structure will be used three to four years later to make the ascending corridor and for the grand gallery. They continued the molds and construction of the well shaft simultaneously. The walls of the well shaft have support notches for workers' feet, so that they could come down and come out of the pyramid when it was complete 13 years later. Thus, they arrive at the level of the cave known as the grotto. At this level, they left a cavity and a block of granite to plug the well shaft behind them. The workers pour the first blocks of the pyramid. The volume of the cavity is estimated at around 450,000 cubic meters. That is not much compared to the 2.6 million cubic meters remaining. The workers are now approaching the surface. A fourth passage is opened to speed up the work. The work is divided into two work sites. Some mix and others fill. In order to free up the space of the pyramid, the ground limestone is made into concrete and poured in the center. The land beneath the platform of the pyramid is fully graded. Filling the cavity took approximately three years based on calculated estimates. This technique of arranging natural cavities was used for all the pyramids. It is particularly evident in the Pyramid of Medum. Follow the lines. The cavity was fitted out with formwork molds and limestone concrete. The walls, the floor, and the ceiling were made by pouring concrete. It is easier to fill in than to dig and carve out a cave. At the beginning, they form a dozen African lines. A team digs the soft limestone and a team does the mixing. The other workers line up in African file to carry the buckets from hand to hand. Once the buckets are emptied, they return them in the same way. 260 men are needed for each bucket brigade, a real conveyor belt. The organization is precise and meticulous. They poured the slab of the pyramid one cubit east with recesses to pose the cornerstones. The floor is made with limestone and lots of water. The addition of water allows the soil to self-level perfectly. This explains the horizontal precision of the floor to the nearest 21 millimeters. No need for extraterrestrial technology. From the tunnel, they trace the perimeter of the pyramid with ropes and sticks. At 220 cubits, in the middle of the future south face of the pyramid, they put a picket four cubits inward. The workers realign themselves with respect to the new point in the center. The first segment of the apothem perimeter is done. They then line up 90 degrees with a wooden angle and do the same on the other side. Same for the other two sides. 
The perimeter of the future pyramid is now drawn, precise to the millimeter in apothem. It is a perimeter of eight sides which is drawn on the ground with ropes. It is the future shape of the pyramid. Once the pyramid was completed, at each equinox one sees the sides divided in half by a shadow. The equinoxes are visible to the naked eye tens of kilometers away. It is at this stage that the architect Hemiuni stops filling the center and continues with molded stones. From now on, construction is done with stones poured into the formwork molds. The molds for the cornerstones are graduated with a slope of 51.50 degrees. The most difficult work is in grinding the limestone and preparing the mixture to make concrete. The first molds are in place. About 1,200 workers mix limestone with natron and lime in the basins. They then line up to transport the buckets from hand to hand. The four cornerstones of the exterior facing are poured. The blocks of the first row are three cubits high. Then they continue towards the center, meticulously following the ropes and the pickets. The first row of stones is poured. They leave the row open in different places. These are openings to let the lines of bucket carriers pass. It is estimated that 40 bucket brigades were necessary to transport the buckets one by one, as well as all the equipment. By working three months a year, eight hours a day, and with buckets of 15 kilograms, the pyramid was completed between 10 and 13 years in good humor, joy, and pleasure. Once the base row was completed, the workers continued to fill the interior with brown limestone, less attractive than that of the exterior. Inside, every other block was made with molds. The next day, they filled in the intervals. Then they poured the second row, and then they casually filled the interior. This is how they erected the pyramid from the bottom to the top. More convincing proof that the pyramid is made of geopolymer concrete. It is true that Jean-Pierre Adam says that no stone is like the other. 
Davidovitz, who tells us that the pyramids are built with molded artificial stones. Common sense, the common sense of a butcher, a good, honorable man, says if we mold materials like bricks, they will all have the same shape. There will only be one mold for all stones. Well, yes, it seems logical. It is common sense. Thank you. However, there are not two stones among the millions of stones of the Great Pyramid that have the same dimensions. They are all unique. The row heights are respected in the siding and approaching the siding, but not for the rest. They are all different. So why would we give ourselves the difficulty to make millions of molds to make millions of stones? Although it was so simple to make row bricks and standardize the construction of the pyramids. To make it look like that's not how they did it. It makes it possible to say, this affirmation is quackery. Common sense tells you it's so. You don't have to be an Egyptologist. You have provided arguments to justify the use of the word charlatan. This is your response? I find it convincing. But he does not say that all the stones of each and every row have an identical height. It is unimaginable that hundreds of thousands of stones from the second row, for example, were cut to the same height, to the nearest centimeter. No white massive stones were ever brought from Tura. The white limestone used for the facing stones was extracted in the surrounding area. Davidovitz's analyses show that the composition of the Kufi stones does not contain Tura limestone. We compared the composition of natural limestone samples from quarries of Tura and Madi with stones from the pyramid of Khufu, and we discovered a number of anomalies. First observation. The composition of the stones of the pyramids is much more complex than those of official quarry stones. Certain micro-constituents of these stones show traces of a fast chemical reaction that didn't allow them a natural crystallization. An inexplicable reaction if the stones were cut, but perfectly understandable if we admit that they were made like concrete. So that confirms the thesis defended for 30 years by the inventor of geopolymers, the French chemist, also an Egyptologist, Joseph Davidovitz. One estimates that the construction of the pyramid required around 7,000 or 8,000 workers. They had to be fed and housed daily. A hundred people oversaw taking care of these workers. The Greek historian Herodotus described the builders of the pyramids as slaves. This gave birth to a popular myth perpetuated by the sweeping epic films of the Hollywood studios of the 1960s. A site where hundreds of thousands of slaves would have worked is unthinkable. It would have required as many Egyptians to oversee them. If some still think that it was slaves who built the pyramids, it is because they are not up to date. All archaeologists and Egyptologists are categoric. There were no slaves in Egypt. In January 2010, Zahi Hawass discovered a series of tombs dating from the time of the construction of the pyramids. They are those of the workers buried near their pharaoh. They would never have been buried with so much honor if they had been slaves, he says. Skeletons were found in the fetal position, the head facing west and the feet eastward, according to tradition in ancient Egypt. It is the ERA project under the direction of Dr. Mark Lerner which made it possible to discover the village workers. It was found 400 meters from the Sphinx. The dwellings could accommodate thousands of men. Archaeologists have found a hundred seals bearing the names of Khafre and Menkor. Evidence suggests that these men regularly consumed meat and worked in three-month periods. The whole kingdom was involved in the construction of the pyramid. It was a national project. Workers came from all over the country. They now continue to fill the interior as well as the descending corridor simultaneously with the well shaft. This is the reason why we notice in the underground tunnel a part which is made in masonry stones, and part of the tunnel is made of natural limestone in perfect continuity. They start the ascending corridor. At this stage, 600,000 cubic meters of limestone concrete have been moved. Classic theory says that three granite plugs were stored in a large gallery to later be released and plug the entrance. The large gallery is very narrow. 
If the three granite plugs had been stored somewhere, it would have been a big problem for its construction. There is no trace of friction or scratches on the walls. In addition, the walls are not smooth, which does not facilitate sliding. Conversely, the traces of friction are found in the large gallery because of the cart. Blocks that descend as seen in animation cannot slide in real life. A photo taken in the 50s and 60s totally contradicts the fact that the three granite plugs were released from the large gallery. The three granite plugs were poured and then stored there next to the entrance. Yes, you heard right. Poured. Poured granite. Official theory says that the obelisk was carved out of the rock with dolerite balls, but that after the rock cracked, it was abandoned. I would like to keep the mystery of the granite a secret, but that would give the UFO and Atlantis theorists a hook to hang their hat on. To understand granite, you must touch it. You must try to break it to immediately feel its power. One can feel the fiery depths of the earth, the magma. Natron mixed with lime gives caustic soda. Caustic soda mixed with water and white sand heated to 1,000 degrees Celsius produces sodium silicate referred to as liquid glass or water glass. They mixed it with potassium silicate obtained by the same process. They poured the liquid into a lens-shaped mold. Two to three days later, they unmolded the transparent lens, a lens that focuses light at one point, a magnifying glass. The larger the lens, the higher the temperature. Everyone can make their own solar lens with the recipe. Have fun. With a five meter diameter lens, the temperature reaches 1,800 degrees to 2,000 degrees Celsius. The Egyptians have just discovered solar energy. Everything is melted, nothing can resist. Granite literally melts at once, like lava. The Egyptians poured this lava into clay molds. And here is the famous statue of the third dynasty, Huni the grandfather of Khufu, in the Aswan granite. Vases harder than steel, like these in tracheandesite, dating from at least 3500 BC. Here is how the granite was extracted and what happened with the unfinished obelisk in Aswan. The workers in the Aswan quarry were responsible for extracting the granite in cobblestone-sized pieces. These are small pieces of 30 to 40 centimeters, which were extracted from the molten granite with stone shovels. Once cooled, these pieces were transported by boat to Giza, over 900 kilometers away. When they reached Giza, they were melted again and then poured into clay molds. To estimate the volume of granite to take away, the workers cut out this part of the quarry in the form of an obelisk, which was completely melted one week later and transported in cobblestone-sized pieces. Here, a ball of dolerite fell in the granite in lava form, and it got stuck there for millennia. Nature does not do that. The melting of the granite was done from May to August. The traces of all the granite extractions are tilted. This corresponds to the best trajectory of the sun. During these months, its intensity is the strongest. The geologist of a tourist group was surprised by the absence of faults, fractures, in natural granite. This is natural, and it is normal, and there, there is nothing. There are no faults. How is it possible? This is normal, because the molten granite, once cooled, is like new, out of the ground. The workers melted the granite using the lens. Then they began to cut notches and holes in the granite while playing with the solar ray of the lens.
suddenly the site was abandoned. This is how the Egyptians melted all kinds of stone. Quartz, granite, schist, basalt, diorite, nice, gray whack. No luck, they did not come upon ferrous earth, otherwise they would have discovered steel. Solar energy was fully deployed. Queen Hatshepsut in Karnak writes that her obelisk was completed in seven months. This is entirely possible with the lens. The Colossi of Memnon, weighing 1,800 tons each, were made with a mixture of quartz and molten granite. The Egyptians mined copper for thousands of years in the Sinai mines. Copper is a very soft material used to make pans that were used to make the silicate-making mixture. Why is there no evidence? Throughout its history, humanity has waged wars for energy. A forest, a field, a coast, a lake, its potential food, its energy. Throughout its existence, humanity has waged wars for energy. So, you have to imagine that such a discovery had to remain secret. It was passed on discreetly from generation to generation. Today, solar is the most accessible and cheapest energy. It is free. The evidence that the granite was cast with solar lenses could possibly be found in the archives of the Vatican, Paris, London, and Cairo. I put forward a theory different from that of Joseph Davidovitz. Egyptian concrete was done in another, simpler way. The clay limestone was heated with the solar lenses at 1,300 degrees to 1,500 degrees Celsius. After cooling, it becomes cement, like modern Portland cement. It simply required mixing it with the limestone and water on site, as with the concrete. Serious analysis is needed to find if it is geopolymer or cement made using solar lenses. To build the pyramid with cement and heat the clay at a temperature of 1,200 to 1,500 degrees Celsius, they used solar lenses. It took about 300,000 tons of sodium carbonate and 500,000 tons of lime to build the pyramid. Solar energy was also used in the baking of breads and for the preparation of meals, because otherwise thousands of palm trees would have had to be burnt to make lime, to power the bread ovens and to cook the meals of thousands of workers. In two years, there would have been total deforestation and civil revolt. Wood was very precious because it was scarce and the few palm forests provided some shade for crops. Cutting a palm tree was really the last thing to do. Without the discovery of solar energy, there would have been no pyramids. Egypt would not have arrived where it arrived. Thanks to solar energy, the Egyptians preserved nature. At night, the spectacle was extraordinary. The three granite blocks were poured on site and were stored next to the ascending tunnel. They arrived at the end of the corridor. The well shaft was also completed.
At this height, 1,200,000 cubic meters have been transported. It's almost half the volume of the pyramid. The entrance to the pyramid is built with symbolic V-shaped chevrons. They build the horizontal corridor and then start the middle chamber. At the location of the shafts, they lay a trunk 20 by 20 centimeters, which will make the shaft towards the star Sirius. They lay the formwork molds and pour the blocks of white limestone walls. Making a simple cut stone tunnel is too complicated. However, it is logical to create it with concrete. Poured into a form, it takes any form and they can keep the angle precisely. They start the northern shaft and stop every few meters. The workers build the southern shaft, then fill it. They cover the horizontal corridor and the middle chamber. The filling continues to a certain level on the other side to the south. It's time to close the first passages. The passages of the extremities are blocked first, from top to bottom. The wooden mold comes from the ground level. The frame is supported by the beams. The workers fill the mold with limestone concrete from the ground. A few moments later, they continue with the next stone. This is the method that was used to close the siding throughout the construction.
They build the floor of the large gallery in continuity with the ascending corridor. The pyramid continues to fill up and they reach the ground level of the king's chamber. Then, using the solar lens, they pour the first floor of the king's chamber and the harrows in Aswan red granite. The harrows are planned based on the location of the wooden beams. The last block of the floor is in a V-shape to let the ropes for the carriage mold to pass. The Egyptians had the innovative idea of making the Grand Gallery Corridor in an inclined corbelled arch. The model was taken from the Red Pyramid and the Pyramid of Medum. This time the gallery is on an incline and not horizontal. All of this was planned from the start. To carry out the cantilevering of the Grand Gallery, they built an extraordinary wooden movable carriage mold. Here is the carriage mold. The movable mold is fixed to the ground in the notches on the floor. It measures eight meters high with seven levels. These seven levels were used to complete the formwork mold on one side. The exterior side was completed with standard formwork molds. They start building from the bottom up the movable mold is in place. They close the mold on the other side and then pour limestone into it. They continue like this for the upper floors. They pour the last block and the ceiling. At the same time, the rest of the team can continue to fill on either side. While the limestone is drying, workers install copper notches. This explains yet again that it is limestone concrete and not cut stones. Structurally, these copper notches hold nothing. The Egyptians knew this very well. The bench seat is not completely dry when the carriage mold passes, which explains the traces of wood found by Jean-Pierre Houdin. Houdin found a kind of elevator. The carriage mold had a counterweight to lift the stones. According to Houdin, it traveled back and forth, in truth, the carriage made only one pass from the bottom to the top, and it was much larger. Construction of the Grand Gallery progresses, and workers continue to fill it on the side and from above. As each part is built and filled, the workers pull the wooden carriage mold from the top of the platform, continuing cubit by cubit. The Grand Gallery is almost finished. The dimensions of the king's chamber are 10 cubits by 20 cubits and 11.18 cubits high. Some may assume that the simple-minded Egyptians said to themselves, let's make the king's chamber two simple cubes side by side, and that's that, nothing special. Really? Indeed, it is this little 11.18 cubits which makes us once again discover in a spectacular way the scientific level reached by the Egyptians. The four universal constants, pi, golden ratio, royal number, and meter, are merged in the most perfect and incredible way. If we connect the corners of the room with lines, we discover that the perimeter of the room is 31,416 meters, or pi in tenths of a meter. The sum of the three sides of this triangle is equal to 52.36 cubits, the royal constant. This triangle is the sacred triangle of Isis, three, four, five. And now, forget the units of measure, the meter, the cubit, the inch, the yard, the mile, etc. The Egyptian idea is to express the number 100 by building the room with 100 stones. They selected seven numbers used to obtain a total of 100 stones. They calculated their square roots. Then, the golden ratio, phi, squared, multiplied by the square root of 4, 5, 9, 16, 20, 21, 25. 
In order to show us 4,500 years later that these equations are correct, using the results of these equations, they built the room in meters. This demonstrates that the king's chamber is built directly with the sacred standard, the universal, the centimeter. This is the scientific level of the Egyptians. Here is what we know, they tell us. They did not engrave the equations in hieroglyphs, but instead used mathematics to express their knowledge. Here, everything is made of unalterable granite, so that this message does not move by one millimeter over time. This message, this scientific feat, will envelop the soul of the leader of this great civilization, the leader named Khufu. The Egyptians understood the essence of all things, that God, or the architect of the universe, built nature and all of its components using a matrix called mathematics. They then applied it to themselves, in turn, like gods. They integrated math everywhere, which deeply connected them to nature. This way of building based on universal constants was spread everywhere on Earth over the millennia. Cathedrals, churches, and various buildings were carried out with the cubit, the meter, pi, and phi, which were mystically called sacred geometry. It is for this reason that when you enter a cathedral, you feel good and immediately at peace. Nowhere in the world does a monument or object such as the Pyramid of Khufu exist. In his 311-page book, The Chamber of Khufu, the author expresses his admiration in just four sentences. It would be futile to look for traces of improvisation, modifications, or imperfections. From floor to ceiling, everything is perfectly executed, says Gilles Dormion. The small granite cobblestones from Aswan are transported by human chains. Thus, 1,500 tons of granite are erected in blocks of 30 to 40 kilograms. The sarcophagus is built first, then the tunnel openings, the north and south walls, and finally those of the west and the east. The sarcophagus is made with a sliding cover with three peg holes which pushed to the bottom, release the nails and make the final closure. Khafre adopted the same solution for his sarcophagus. The workers laid the clay mold and poured the granite lava. They used clay beams for the walls of the shafts. A few days later, once the walls had cooled, they removed the clay. The construction of the room lasted three to four months. Cutting granite to make such perfect walls in that time is just inconceivable. However, it is entirely possible with molten granite. The walls of the king's chamber are finished. The two shafts target the stars of Sirius and Alnilam. The middle chamber shaft will point to Sirius at 39 degrees 49 minutes, December 4th at midnight, 0 hundred hours at 180 degrees. Alnilam is at the heart of the Orion constellation. The king's shaft will target Analem on November 11th, also at 0 hundred hours to 180 degrees. Note the breathtaking precision of the sky measurements, knowing that the stars move. If this is all chance, then all the science we know today belongs in the trash. The celestial hemisphere was cut in 360 degrees. 
the sky is in constant motion and never looks like the next era or the previous. To immortalize the era, the date of the reign and that of the king's death, the date of the construction of the pyramid and the memory of all who worked there, they used the sky configuration of that year. This gives us precisely the date of the construction of the Great Pyramid between 2560 and 2550 BC. Fifty years later or earlier, the shafts would never be aligned again. This means that they had a thorough knowledge of astronomy. The Egyptians knew the hour and time. They had discovered the clock. The day was divided into 24 hours and the hour into 60 minutes. We call this a clepsydra, a very mysterious name which is nothing more than a clock, a water clock. Interestingly, clocks using water were used even in the 1800s. Another discovery with water. The vase was graduated in levels. Water flowed from a hole and indicated the time precisely. The workers continue to build and cover the southern shaft of the king's chamber. They fill around the king's chamber and the south shaft, then they continue with the anteroom and the harrows. The northern tunnel of the king's chamber makes a detour, then construction stops at the gallery level. The ceiling beams are cast in turn. Today, we see cracks in the granite beams. According to Jean-Pierre Houdin and their salt systems, the accident happened when the whole pyramid was finished which is why it was necessary to open a tunnel to check the damage. Except that once the limestone hardened, it was impossible to dig the tunnel. The beams were cracked because the granite had not cooled sufficiently or perhaps due to improper handling of the mold during cooling. Note the traces of the wooden beams of the scaffolding which hold the concrete formwork mold. Because of the pressure exerted by the beam and the weight of the granite, the lava underwent a chemical reaction that left traces of burns. Some beams cracked. The workers left a passage through the upper floors to observe the beams. In any case, they couldn't fix anything, just investigate. Neither a 3 cm nor a 300 cm offset can cause granite with a resistance of 120 to 200 MPa to crack from the weight. If the weight was the cause of the crack, it would be in the middle of the ceiling beams and not at the ends. The three sides of the beams are straight, only the upper side is irregular. The fourth surface is very smooth. This proves that there was a formwork mold for the beams and that the granite was poured in molten lava form. Not for a single beam, but for all the beams. They move the material the lenses and the granite to the upper floor.
The five granite floors are complete. The limestone vault is built. Egyptologists falsely call this architectural feature weight-relieving chambers. If there had been a weight problem, the Egyptians would have made weight-relieving chambers for the underground chamber as well. The public has no training in engineering and architecture, so some allow themselves to give baseless explanations. A worker writes the name of Khufu quickly. Sitchnin accuses Howard Weiss of having falsified the writing of the name of Khufu, but he is the forger. Khufu's name is correctly written. The entire pyramid is filled except here, at the location of the two north tunnels. The Grand Gallery is hampering the construction of the northern shafts and their roots are diverted a few meters. Once the precise height of 67 meters is reached, the exits of the tunnels of the middle chamber are aligned and they build the tunnel from top to bottom. Once the tunnel has reached the other end, they fill it up to continue to the upper tunnel. At the precise height of 80 meters, the exits from the two tunnels of the king's chamber are also aligned and they build the last shaft, also from top to bottom. All the way at the bottom, the tunnel joins the other end. This is the only solution to have four parallel tunnels with such impressive precision. The interior is built. From now on, they will fill in. This operation required a precise, meticulous, ongoing reading of the height as the pyramid rose. This precision requirement was part of the architect's starting plan 18 years prior. It would have been an improbable plan if cut stones had been used. This explains the offsets and turns of the north tunnels. In 2017, the Pyramid Scan Project announced the discovery of a large cavity which could be a big secret room. This hypothetical cavity is located at the location of the North Tunnels. Indeed, there was a huge cavity which was used to build the North Tunnels, but it was filled in. It is not a secret room, but a difference in density of the limestone. The construction of the shafts is complete. The tunnels will remain open until the death of the king. The pyramid continues to rise. They always pour the siding and then fill the inside. At this point, they have been using the same mold for 10 years. The Egyptians took good care of their tools. The passages close one by one as the pyramid rises. At 140 meters, the teams from east and west stop advancing and start the descent. They pour the apothem facing stone on the way down. Only teams from the south and north continue until the end. The architect Hemiunu and Khufu go up symbolically to unveil the Pyramidion. The Pyramidium is revealed. 
the crowd shouts with joy. 20 years of hard work for their king is coming to an end. The workers will pour the siding down to the height of the tunnels. The construction of the pyramid stops there until the death of the king. Here is the evidence that this method via corridors was used. On the four sides of the pyramid, we see a depression this is due to the large passages in the middle, not to the weight of the siding. We also see inward caving on the siding of the Medum pyramid, proof that it is installed in different stages. We see the same type of passage on the Red Pyramid. However, it is not built as an apothem. A 10-meter high perimeter wall is built around the pyramid. The walls around the Pyramid of Khafre were built in the same way. We see the location of the beams which held the workers' scaffolding. This is the reason why tourist access to this place is closed. The forms were laid and then the concrete was poured. Ditches were dug and arranged all around to store the solar boats. The workers also built the king's temple. His body will come from below, from the harbor. It is from this port and this monumental road that the people will come in pilgrimage worshiping its temple and pyramid. It was a kind of avenue like there are in all the cities today. It aligned with the Betelgeuse stars, Alnilam and Regal in the southwest, 14 degrees, always at midnight. Giza became a sacred place, and in the same period, the Egyptians built the three small pyramids in front of it. Mastabas for priests, workers, and foremen. It was a great honor to have his tomb next to that of the king. The pyramid was oriented east, relative to the sun, their great god, Re. Orientation to the east automatically indicates all directions with the same precision. Indeed, the Egyptians did not care about the north. There was nothing in the north apart from primitive peoples. The south was sacred to them because it was where they came from, their roots. It is for this reason that cities were then built up the Nile, to be closer to their origins. There is much debate over whether the pyramids are tombs, and whether the sarcophagi are intended for bodies. Many of the sarcophagi were empty when discovered. Almost all mummies, whether they are important figures in society or not, have been found in wooden coffins and not in granite sarcophagi. In Egypt, the most important god was the sun god Re. Logical, since there is no life without the sun. The Egyptians considered that each human had a small sun in him. Everyone had their own Re. They observed nature, life, death, and its cycle. The lifeless body is like an inert stone, and it decomposes and returns to nature. The soul, the ray, remained and traveled. This rule also applied to kings. The body returned to earth, the soul to heaven. Thus, the Egyptians saw in statues and temples the king's spirit, which traveled across time. The body was buried elsewhere. The spirit was immortalized in statues and pyramids. What do our loved ones leave us when they leave us? Some leave a house, others leave books, still others paintings or signatures visible in buildings. 
Khufu left for eternity a pyramid that brings together all knowledge, including that of the Egyptians. Soulless flesh is inert and must return to nature. Spirit and memory continue. The pyramid was a path for the king's soul to go to the heavens and the afterlife. The bigger the pyramid, the farther the king could go and find his deserved place. It is for this reason that the tunnels had to be perfectly aligned with the stars. It was not a whim of the king, but a belief. The meaning of this internal architecture is the Jed resurrection. Order, peace, Jed and Nu shaped the human race and the universe. All the pyramids are built west of the Nile. Further proof of these Egyptian religious beliefs. The pyramid is indeed a cenotaph for the soul, a spiritual monument where the meter, the royal constant, pi, golden ratio, chemistry, time, mathematics, astronomy are all inscribed. A souvenir for generations to come. The king is dead. A large public ceremony takes place for all the people. The king's body arrives from the port. He is mummified in the temple. The king's body is lowered into the underground chamber to symbolize procreation in the belly. Then there's birth. It comes out of the dark and into daylight, symbolized by arrival at ground level. He grows up and becomes king. He reigned with justice and righteousness. He was led throughout his life by Sirius. The king begins to age. The large gallery symbolizes his work, the country he led during his lifetime. The return symbolizes old age and wisdom. It is the last path, a kind of passion of Christ. A ceremony led by priests accompanies the rite. The priests pull the body using the ropes for its final ascent from the granite harrows. Granite, sacred symbolism. The king's remains arrive in his last home, where his soul will depart for eternity. The body will remain there until Ra arrives, July 14th. His body is placed in the sarcophagus, and his boat is buried in front of his pyramid. While waiting for Ra, in order to fight the darkness, the king's soul went out at night thanks to the shafts, so his soul could navigate the heavens. and then return before sunrise in order to rest. The underground chamber and the middle chamber are perfectly centered in the axis of the pyramid, except that of the king. This is the first thing that strikes you when you look at a cross-section of the pyramid. An anomaly? An imperfection? No. It corresponds to a specific ritual. The position of the sun is exactly facing the king's sarcophagus. The king is waiting for Ra in his chamber. On July 14th, Ra comes to seek the soul of the king. They leave together for eternity.
The body is soulless. The remains will be buried in a secret place. The pyramid can now be closed. This pyramid and its symbolism were to remain closed for eternity in privacy. Leaving with the remains, the workers close the room with granite blocks provided for this purpose. The workers leave a dolerite ball and a copper hook as a souvenir in the middle chamber. Then they plug the holes. They move the three granite plugs to close the entrance and fill in the empty space around them. They take the exit from the well shaft built 15 years earlier. They descend to the level of the grotto and place the block of granite behind them. They descend to the basement and they close the underground chamber with another block of granite. They climb to the surface. Outside, they lay the facing stones on their way and seal the entrance. And so, the pyramid is closed. By blocking the entrances with granite stones, the Egyptians thought that the pyramid would be inviolable. They hadn't imagined that centuries later, man would discover iron, dynamite, and explosives. Is this or isn't it Khufu's cenotaph? We can have a definitive answer. In 1970, a project to explore the shafts of the pyramid with robots was born. It's the Jedi project. In the south shaft of the middle chamber, the robot discovered traces of drawing in red, which date from the construction. Just take the samples of this paint and compare its chemical composition with that of the hieroglyphs found in the cavities of the king's chamber. It may be the same hand. The greatest architect in the history of humanity is Hemiunu, the one who designed the Khufu pyramid, with less than 1% error. The pyramids are not aligned with the three stars in the middle of the constellation of Orion, as argued by Boval. The Alnitak star falls 150 meters outside the Menkor pyramid. 150 meters of error is huge and unlikely compared to the accuracy of the alignment of the pyramids to one centimeter. The three pyramids are aligned with the Betelgeuse stars, Alnilam and Rigel. The correlation is perfect. We see a form of egocentrism in Khafre, who wanted to outdo his father. He built his pyramid as large as that of his father. He positioned it so that it corresponds with the heart of the Orion, the star Alnilam, obliging his son Menkor to line up with the Rigel. Khafre also built the main roadway in alignment with the night rising of Alnilam. There are about 230 temples in Egypt. None were carved. They were all poured with limestone concrete. When the concrete was still fresh, they could engrave scenes. For granite obelisks, a clay mold was prepared in advance with the hieroglyphs printed in negative. The granite lava was poured, and after cooling, the workers erected the obelisk. There is no trace of a chisel or shock on the obelisks to confirm that they have been chiseled. A trace of a chisel would still be visible even 5,000 years later. The obelisks are perfectly smooth. It is a sign that the granite has been cast in lava. The entire sphinx was made of geopolymer concrete. For this, the workers dug to free up space. They poured a slab and placed a large pile of concrete over it, which they modeled by hand, and they decorated the sphinx with cobblestones. We can distinguish its head, which bears marks of concrete. Over the centuries, the coating in cobblestones fell. The rain that poured down from the top in large quantities eroded furrows. 
But who is the Sphinx? Khafre or another king? A lion's head which would have been reworked to be transformed into Pharaoh's head? Whatever. The question is, what does the head of the Sphinx look like? With 3D face reconstruction software, here is the face of the Sphinx reconstructed correctly for the first time. No comment. Since they were black, it makes sense to make a sculpture in their image. Like a painter who paints his god in his image, the Egyptians made the Sphinx to theirs. It is hard to imagine white Egyptians making a sculpture of their god or their king with a Negro profile. Yes, you heard the word Negro. It is unfair to show you a recipe without showing you the real chef of this monument. Look at all this sculpture. You'll notice one thing. They all have broken noses. If one observes the statue and frescoes, the resemblance is striking. The nose, the big lips. Indeed, many said you have a broken nose because they had, as they say, a negro nose. Herodotus say that Colchon was a colony of the Egyptian because they had black skin and curly hair. Book 2, Euterp. The Colchon were an African colony which migrated to settle near the Black Sea. Aristotle also spoke of the Egyptian, describing them as excessively black. Those who are excessively black are coward. They are the Egyptian and the Ethiopians. The Greek use four words to say black, dark brown. Keleinos, Eremnos, Aiton and Melas. Melas is the most complete physical black. It is the root of the word that forms the word melanin. Melas, melanin. Melanin is the pigment that colors the skin black to protect it from the sun. Aristotle will say precisely agan melanes to designate the Egyptian and the Ethiopians, which mean excessively black in Greek. Zesostris III, called Senusert in Egyptian, holds the record for the number of sculptures in his effigy, dozen. Almost all of these sculptures have broken noses, but some escape the Russian Inquisition. The Senegalese professor Diop asked the Caire Museum to take three samples measuring only one square millimeter from mummy of Ramses II, Seti I and Tutmosis III exhibited at the Museum of Cairo. Once the sample would have been analyzed, they will have revealed the level of melanin. The higher the rate of melanin, the darker the skin. That I put at the disposal of the participants of the conference so that we can observe them under a microscope. And we can absolutely see the degree of melanin under the skin of ancient Egyptians. There is enough left despite the partial destruction of the epidermis. In the region between the dermis and the epidermis, there are enough inclusions of the melanocyte bases, areas where the melanin would have resided, to reveal a level of melanin via these inclusions, absolutely absent in leucoderma races. And last year, I wanted to apply this study to the royal mummy of Ramses II, Seti I, and Thutmose III. For one year, I have been writing to the curator of the Cairo Museum, because I don't need more than a square millimeter one square millimeter of skin, but not always in the same region. And, I regret, I did not obtain these samples. So you see, it is a very easy, accessible study that can be done. Here are the blades. These are the preparations. Just put them under the lens of the microscope to see the melanin level. So based on my own investigations, here they are. Until further investigation. The museum has still not responded for 35 years. The Egyptians were called Kemets and Egypt was called Kemet, the land of the black. No, it is not the black color of the Nile silt, which is mentioned as some archaeologists claim, but the color of the skin of the people living there. When we speak of white country, we are not referring to the color of the snow in the Alps. 
Let's end the remorse of whether or not Howard Carter falsified the golden mask of Tutankhamun and reproduced false relic. Observe the mask of Tutankhamun and the face of this African girl. I can see Carter, the European, falsifying the African steel mask. It is noon. The temperature is at full force. That is to say that is about 45 to 46 degrees Celsius. There is absolutely no shade, since it's a quarry and there is no building and we can absolutely not take shelter. So much as to say that I will not stay here three and a half hours. It is getting a little warm here. We are behind the pyramid of Menko. I'm beginning to understand why Femi did not come. In Egypt, during the summer months, the season during which the pyramid was built, temperature reached 45 degrees Celsius and higher. Under this overwhelming sun, no other human race could survive shirtless more than four days without experiencing severe skin burn. The only race capable of withstanding days and months without problem and without sunscreen is the Negro race with black skin. I paint and I never had a preference for this or that color. A painter likes all the colors, but we say that we must give back to Caesar what belonged to Caesar. Well, let's give back to the Egyptian what belongs to the Egyptian. The Egyptian of the pyramid for millennia were Negroes, neither olive skinned nor mulatto, but charcoal black. The Egyptians memorialized and imprinted their negritude in granite and quartz for eternity. What must we do? Destroy them to erase this era of humanity? Hide them? Speak out? Say nothing? Ask yourself these questions. For better or for worse, this story does not end there. It can cross anyone's mind to draw this shape. Nothing exceptional. On the planet, the probability that there are two civilizations which know how to make concrete in its chemical complexity, to smelt copper, and to attach them symbolically with the same shape is unimaginable. Yet thousands of kilometers separate them and the ocean. An investigative detective will tell you it was the same person, the same hand that made them. The mystery is solved until proven otherwise. Technically, these staples do not connect anything and do not strengthen the stones at all. The Egyptians knew it. It is a religious element. Egyptians spread it everywhere on Earth. In at least 2590 BC, Heda, a court scientist, saluting these companions who were going towards Lebanon to look for oak wood, noted that the boats disappeared after a few minutes, diving below the horizon. However, the distance is not great. The human eye looks much further. He realized the extraordinary. The Earth is round. Expeditions were prepared. The Egyptians then left to explore the Earth. They knew that they cannot get lost. Since the Earth is round, they can always return to the starting point. The Egyptians knew navigation systems and infallibly mastered orientation. They had tools for universal measurements of distance and time, the stopwatch. The boats were fast and efficient. They were equipped to go discover the world. At the time of Herodotus, circumnavigating Africa by boat had become a promenade. When he stopped digging the canal which joined the waters of the Nile to the Arabian Gulf, Nico sent the Phoenicians on ships with orders to return through the columns of Hercules into the Septentrional Sea and back from this way in Egypt. Having thus traveled for two years, the third year they passed the columns of Hercules and returned to Egypt. Thousands of Egyptians traveled to America, now Guatemala, for the first time between 2000 and 3000 years BC. But not only the Egyptians, many other Africans accompanied them. Imagine, you are Mayans and you want to build a building to commemorate the dead or the gods. You observe and copy nature. You make graves in a circle, square and all kinds of shapes. 
the last shape that comes to mind is that of a pyramid, and even less with tunnels passing underneath, as in Egypt. Recent analyses of Egyptian mummies have revealed traces of cocaine. The coca grows only in America. In addition, you must imagine them observing and measuring the equinoxes and solstices to align the pyramids. The Egyptian calendar started on July 14th, plus five days of celebration. That of Mayans also started on July 14th, plus five days of celebration. Then find the chemical formula for making concrete. By comparing the buildings of America and those of Egypt, the resemblance is striking, like two drops of water. Stronger evidence? What if we measured the pyramids of Central America? Before watching this film, the discovery of the standard of universal measurement, the meter, was a secret. It was complicated and abstract to find this universal standard. Now you know how the meter was invented by the Egyptians. And now the ultimate. The Egyptians who arrived here on the other side of the world built a pyramid with the meter and pi. The base of the Pyramid of the Sun measures 220 meters. Converted into units of inches, feet, or from yard, it becomes difficult for workers. In meters, the numbers are whole. The diagonal of the pyramid is pi in meters. The base of the pyramid, 220 meters, divided by the height. That is to say, 70 meters. The result is pi, 3.1428. Compared with Khufu, pi, 3.1429. The error is 0.0001%. The layout of the other pyramids is also in integers, in meters. The geometry of the Tikal pyramid is exactly that of Khufu. In 1983, archaeologist Garth Norman discovered that the Egyptian royal cubit was used by the builders in the edifices of Central America. The big year, the year of the 26,000 years of axial precession of the equinoxes, is present on a map of Orion, inscribed on the Izapa Stella. The idea that a pre-Mayan people, or that the Mayans found and developed alone, isolated from the rest of the world, meter, pi, royal cubit, geopolymer concrete, and solar energy to melt the stone, is totally excluded. The probability is zero. On the other hand, we see here indisputably the same fingerprint, the same civilization, Egypt. 12,000 kilometers separate Egypt from Mexico. How did they manage to cross 7,800 kilometers of ocean? Between 2,000 and 3,000 years BC, the Egyptians crossed the Mediterranean, passed through Malta, refueled in Spain, and crossed the Atlantic Ocean in a straight line to get to Yucatan. They arrived by the thousands, and there is no shortage of Negroid faces. In 1946, giant heads called Olmecs were discovered. We see clearly African Negro heads. The African Olmecs were discovered in Central America, at the very place where the pyramids were found. It is the Egyptians' landing place. The Egyptians may have crossed the ocean via a land bridge, a continent in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. When Plato indicates Atlantis after the columns of Hercules, in other words, after the Strait of Gibraltar, it is very likely that he is right. This large expanse that would surface would be the ridge of the Atlantic. Atlantis would be the Azores. Following an unprecedented earthquake, this part of the ridge would have collapsed. It is this cataclysm, which Plato calls the sinking of Atlantis, which cut the Egyptian Africans in two. Given the trips they made, they may have built buildings here before the upheaval. Research of this bridge should be done at this point of the ridge. This theory may seem far-fetched, but the chemistry, the pi, the meter, the golden number, the royal cubit, and the solar lenses did not cross the ocean on their own. They may have crossed the Atlantic with boats directly. Christopher Columbus made the second trip from the Canary Islands to Guadeloupe in 21 days. Documents speak of it. In less than 20 days, we saw land. It was an island without harbor or ports. Unable to land there, Columbus came to disembark on a neighboring island, which he called Dominica. 
They followed the trade winds. These are the regular and very powerful winds that cross the ocean from east to west. In fact, the sailors were worried about not being able to head into them on the return. They too had wooden boats and sailboats like those of Columbus. What is certain is that there is no question. The Egyptians crossed the Atlantic with their knowledge stored in their luggage. Hey, Max! Tu te souviens comment on a commencé? Tu m'étonnes. On a mis des années. Pendant un an, dans le grenier de la maison, on s'est construit une pirogue. Pour qu'elle soit belle, il fallait qu'elle soit en bois. Et voilà le travail. Elle mesure 6,50 mètres de long et pèse 300 kg avec son balancier. Pour tester notre yacht, on ira à Lanzarote aux îles Canaries. Et après, on se tapera 6500 km d'Atlantique sans aucun instrument. On visera l'île de la Désirade à la Guadeloupe. C'est une île minuscule, elle ne fait que 10 km de long. Les étoiles ça fait très longtemps qu'on les regarde. Pour mieux comprendre le ciel, on a fabriqué une tête de veau. Normalement, c'est ça le ciel qu'on verra si on est à la bonne latitude. Et ça, c'est la croix du sud. Lanzarote, nous voilà enfin aux Canaries. Ça y est, on est parti. On n'a pas de boussole à bord et pas de montre. Pas de lock et pas de sextant. Il n'y a pas de radio émetteur ni de transistor, ça pourrait nous donner l'heure. On n'a aucune carte et pas un bouquin, même pas un guide des étoiles. Et notre réchaud, on l'a laissé aux Canaries. On mangera froid. Mesurer nos cars sans montre, c'est vraiment difficile. Je vais crever, je vais crever. sud-ouest jusqu'à pendant une dizaine de jours. Il y a une part de nuages qui est venue peu à peu, on n'a plus vu d'étoiles, aucune étoile sur 360 degrés. Elles ont toutes disparu. Le vent a forcé et on, on s'est arrêté. On ne sait plus du tout où on est. On va pas aller nulle part. On est stoppé. On attend. On attend. La beauté yeah On va bien manger Je vais filmer dehors hein, maintenant, c'est trop beau On s'amuse bien nous deux en pleine mer C'est le pied 
On a vu à Crux, sur euh, la Croix du Sud, à Crux qu'on a estimé à 5 degrés de hauteur. La Croix du Sud fait 6 degrés de hauteur. Et bon, à, à, au pif, c'était à 5 degrés de hauteur. Donc on en déduit qu'on est à peu près à 22 degrés de latitude. Et 22 degrés de latitude, c'est les tropiques. Parce que le tropique, c'est à 23-27 minutes. On n'est pas prêt parce qu'on a passé une nuit de chien avec assez peu de visibilité. Et on n'a jamais vu la Croix du Sud. Au sud, il y, y, y a trop peu d'étoiles. On a beaucoup de mal. Et puis surtout, on a du mal à dormir. Oh, oui. Ces dauphins sont la bienvenue parce que <rire> on le prend toujours comme un bon signe. La mer commence à se calmer et c'est pas trop tôt parce qu'on avait une mer très hachée, très très hachée, très très dure, très très dure physiquement. Enfin, euh, j'espère que demain ce sera plus souple et qu'on pourra accélérer parce que notre vitesse elle dépend aussi de, du confort. Et on est content. On est content parce que euh, on vient d'attaquer la deuxième partie du parcours. Euh, voilà, ça fait 16 jours. Et euh, il commence à faire bon. Hein, grand Ah ouais. C'est la deuxième journée, on peut se foutre en short. C'est super. On n'avance pas parce qu'on ne met pas de toile. On avance à 4-5 nœuds au lieu de filer à 8 nœuds. Parce que dès qu'on est à Vino, on craque nerveux. On craque nerveux. Là, euh, c'est vraiment, vraiment, vraiment dur. On ne sait pas quand on arrive. On n'ose plus mettre de, de toile. On est, on, on est, on est, on est euh, ça va pas quoi. On va lentement, on essaye de se reposer. Alors maintenant. Euh, on a décidé de se raser parce que comme ça, euh, ça ira mieux. Hein? Parce que si on est plus beau, ça va mieux. Ah, on est en train de déjanter totalement. Totalement. Là, maintenant, euh, maintenant, il y a intérêt à aller boire un coup avec nos potes au bistrot et sans prendre de risques comme ça. On est complètement cinglé. Complètement cinglé. Qu'est-ce qu'on va faire demain On est complètement cinglé. Bah surtout toi. Non, toi aussi, tu es complètement cinglé. Qu'est-ce qui nous pousse à faire des trucs comme ça On est complètement cinglé. Ça fait du bien. C'est pour fêter. Cette nuit, on a vu la croix du sud et en dessous, les deux étoiles de la mouche. On est à peu près à la bonne latitude. Il y a un pitaine qui nous a filé une bouteille de pif avant le départ. Un oiseau, un oiseau différent. Qu'est-ce que ça peut vouloir dire 
Est-ce que c'est encore un de ces oiseaux de mer Je le dis tout net, il est grand temps, mais vraiment grand temps, que cette histoire de fou s'arrête très très vite. Il y a une île, il y a une île Regarde Regarde là-bas Je vois rien Mais si, c'est pas un nuage On n'a rien cassé, on n'a rien cassé, c'est super Et Alors quelle île c'est Quelle île Quelle île Mais En tout cas, moi... C'est la désirade on est arrivé avec une précision parfaite Eh hey Max, qu'est-ce qu'il disait de Garpo Il disait « Ceux qui rêvent le jour auront toujours un avantage sur ceux qui ne rêvent que la nuit. » These mysterious people called Olmec are Afro-Egyptians. The Olmec heads are also made of concrete. What impressed me was the Ethiopian type it represents. I reflected upon it, and indubitably there had been blacks in this country, and it had been during the earliest ages of the world. Once settled, they developed a writing similar in shape and meaning to Egyptian hieroglyphics. Far from Africa, the Egyptians invented a new variation of writing resembling their hieroglyphics. They continued to develop their beliefs and knowledge, thanks to the memories of their distant ancestors. On Stella V of Izapa, the Tree of Life, we see the three pyramids of Giza with the temples in front, the waves symbolizing the trip to America, and the roots of the tree, their descendants. And finally, the great apocalyptic wave, Here are details of the Stella's E and D of Quirigua. The two figures have the same posture holding the scepter, and all three have the same type of beard as that of Tutankhamun. The Native Americans had no beards, not to mention broken noses. On the architecture side in America, as in Egypt, the workers applied the same construction method of pyramids and temples. All life was organized around them. The limestone was burned to make lime and mortar, With this mortar, they built all the pyramids of Central America. Hundreds of pyramids and temples were built in Guatemala, in the Yucatan and southern Mexico. All were built by Afro-Egyptians, made of concrete volcanic ash mixed with lime. They were all aligned with Sirius, the stars of the constellation Orion. Later, they moved to Teotihuacan and Tula. Here, it wasn't whole concrete blocks like in Egypt, but natural volcanic stone mixed with concrete. The construction method is the same for Khufu Pyramid via corridors. Of course, the city of Tula and Teotihuacan were built with the Egyptian meter as a unit of measure. The Egyptians aligned the city of Teotihuacan with... Now you know it. The city was aligned at 14 degrees 7, not with the north, but with the southwest, with Betelgeuse, Alnilam, and Rigel, passing through the hemisphere's axis on November 20th at midnight, around at least 2200 BC. This alignment is observed during these years, give or take 50 years. This tells us the date of construction of the city of Teotihuacan. Here they turned around, These buildings were not built by the Mayans. Centuries later, the Mayans and Incas arranged their lives around these cities following the departure of the Africans. The legend explaining that it was the gods who came down to build these temples endured. It seems that coexistence was impossible between these two technologically very different civilizations. Following wars with indigenous people less developed than they, Afro-Egyptians, or as we can now call them, the Amero-Egypto-Africans, migrated little by little towards the South Pacific coast and abandoned these places that the locals subsequently appropriated. They settled in remote, high elevations, 
maybe to have peace. Wherever they went with their powerful solar lenses, these men were taken for gods. They left their imprint and their legends everywhere. There may have been a great cataclysm, a giant 300-meter tsunami that swept away all over the Yucatan Peninsula. The survivors, Egyptians and the local population, abandoned the place quickly and went south. 4,500 kilometers separate Karol from Kalakmul. Again, there are pyramids aligned with Sirius and the site is built with the meter. The journey continues towards Machu Picchu. The Machu Picchu buildings fascinate everyone. The whole site was built in poured andesite and granite, melted into lava thanks to the solar lens. We had to measure to see if we could find the Egyptian royal cubit. Not one stone from the magnificent walls of the sites of Olanta Tambo, Pisa, Cuzco, or Sacsayhuaman were cut. These sites were built by Afro-Egyptians with the solar lens. After their departure, the Incas continued to maintain them, but with a rudimentary technique. The technological gap is obvious. The Temple of the Sun, Corin Cancha, a masterpiece, is also made of molten volcanic andesite stone. There too, a surprise awaits. In Peru, in the city of Cusco, there is a temple called Coricancha. This is a major temple, and I measured its dimensions. It's 10 meters wide on the outside. Each wall is one meter thick, making an enclosure with an interior eight meters wide. So here, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean in Peru, we have a temple with metric units. Here is how the Egyptians reasoned. Pi is divided by the first 10 whole numbers. They use the whole number 7. Pi divided by 7 equals 44.8 to make these niches. This is the basis of the niche. On this basis, they establish the golden rectangle. The base is divided by 7. They subtracted this result from the measurement of the top of the niche. Here is the shape of the niche, which is created, all in centimeters. The margin of error is plus or minus two millimeters. Quentin Laplatte measures. Frankly, given the geometry applied, do you still think that these builders are the Incas? By chance, on the way, they came across a cave with sacred dimensions. They built a single door, the past. On the stones, one can see the imprint of an external object that was placed on the stone when it was poured. The concentrated ray sometimes burns stones due to an error in handling the lens. The Afro-Egyptians descended more and more towards the south. Their migration continued towards the Titicaca region. The same technique was used in Tiwanaku, the Sun Gates and the Temple of Kalasasea. Andesite melted into lava, then poured into molds. 
The theory supported by some researchers explaining that the stones were melted then vitrified by a solar plasma is false, since the surroundings were not affected. In 2018, Joseph Davidovitz published the chemical analyses of the stones of the Gate of the Sun, Tiwanaku, and Puma Punku. To the following conclusion, uh, the thin section of a sample taken from a Puma Punku red sandstone monument shows grain boundaries made of a thick fluidal ferrocylate matrix. To our knowledge, this feature is very unusual in sandstone formed geologically. It is a unicum and supports the idea of artificial sandstone geopolymer concrete. We have blocks, concrete blocks, there. 1,400 years old sandstone geopolymer concrete. But in addition, we have smaller elements that are lying there, which have puzzling structures. And they are made of andesitic rock volcanic rock, and they are really puzzling. They have a most hardness between six and seven, that is like quartz, and they did not have any tools. And this is generating, generating crazy news about the fact humans were not capable of doing this, only the aliens or the super civilizations were the builders of this site. When you go to Peru, and when you go to Bolivia and ask touristic guides, this is what they tell, are telling you. How were such perfect cuts made with simple stone tool, with a material that is so hard? More extravagant feature. We have this stone, it is small, but it contains 20 holes drilled with precision 30 centimeter deep inside the hard stone. There exists no instrument capable of doing this. Our scientific investigation was carried out with a thin section, scanning electron microscopy, and for scanning electron microscopy, we were surprised to find features like these ones. Uh, EDS, organic matter. And organic matter in a volcanic rock. Impossible. The components are linked together by ferrous molecules. This means that stones contain molten iron at a high temperature, 1,500 degrees Celsius. The Egyptians melted the volcanic andesite stone with solar lenses and then poured the lava into molds. These stones were cast in a single mold. There are volcanoes everywhere in this area. The stones of the volcanoes were used as raw material. There are traces of molten stone everywhere. These strange, perfectly identical H-shaped stones that fascinate tourists have been measured. They are also made of molten andesite thanks to the solar lens. Patrice Pouillard measures the stones. One meter stack. Puma Panku stones measure precisely one meter and zero zero millimeters. That's undeniable proof that the Egyptians came here. No astronaut or alien came here, but the Egyptians with the meter and their solar lenses. No ultra sophisticated machine cut these stones, no alien. They are molten stones as was the Aswan granite shale and quartz in Egypt. After demolding, the air bubbles burst and give the impression to the non-expert that it is laser-cut stone. 
the natives transmitted the legend that it was the gods who had built the temples. Yet, viscerally, the symbol of solar lenses is present everywhere. We can clearly see the rather rudimentary restoration done late by the Incas with rough stones loosely laid. The Afro-Egyptians left and their technology was lost, and the locals returned to the Stone Age. There is a site, or rather an extraordinary site, called the Samaipata Fort in Bolivia. Here, they melted red sandstone rock to achieve a wide variety of shapes, animals, niches, and canals. They went up towards Nazca. You will arrive on a plain where you will see gigantic animals drawn on the ground, the largest drawings on Earth. This is where one finds the path to cross to the large body of water. Down there, you follow the two parallel lines. At the time, sea level was about 100 to 150 meters lower than today. Hundreds of islands were therefore exposed. Here is the landscape as it was a few thousand years ago. Afro-Egyptians must have been fewer than one or 2,000. They made the decision to leave the continent to go to these islands. From the Nazca coast, they crossed 80 to 100 kilometers and reached the first island. Then they traveled from island to island to arrive at Easter Island. Here is the proof that the so-called Rapa Nui came from Peru or South America. These six statues are found in Peru. Their resemblance to the Moais of Easter Island is staggering. These statues are identical in design, yet thousands of kilometers separate them. At the Kala Sasea Temple, there is an anthropomorphic statue reminiscent of a Moai from Easter Island. The Australian Alan Carroll, based on good knowledge of the Inca languages, deciphered the Rongo Rongo tablets. In 1892, he published in the Polynesian Society Journal the translation of a tablet explaining the method. He concluded that the scribes who wrote these tablets came from South America. It is, in summary, a story of war and disputes between the clans. Catherine Rutledge organized an Easter Island expedition and unearthed two Moai statues. But we don't know what she really discovered. The Moais were immediately buried, and since then, no one has had the right to dig up a statue. Are there any revealing inscriptions? Moais cut and moved with ropes. It is as fanciful as this image. These men were not only from South America, but were of Afro-Egyptian origin. They built no fewer than 887 Moais on the island, always using the same technique. The statues were cast. No Moai was cut or moved. Ocean salt melted at 600 degrees Celsius was mixed with the volcanic ash and added to sodium silicate to make the Moais with the paste obtained. There is no shortage of Besides, these ashes are natural cement heated to 1500 to 1800 degrees Celsius by volcanoes. I think that the salt that was melted to create this volcanic basalt stone was melted thanks to the solar lenses. Because to melt the quantity of salt used, in addition to the sodium silicate, would have required burning all the tree on the island. Analysis remain to be performed to determine if the moist statues are made of geopolymer concrete, or andesite melted into lava, or cement, obtain it with the solar lenses. The unfinished moai in molten andesite and the unfinished Aswan obelisk in molten granite bear the fingerprint of the same artist. Beyond the molten stone walls which resemble those of Machu Picchu in Peru and the Khafre temple in Egypt, there is further evidence that the Egyptians were on the Easter Island. The meter, the Ahutongariki base upon which the 15 moais are placed, is precisely 100 meters. The entire large roadway measures 220 meters. The builders of these monuments deployed the meter to the end of the world. It is inconceivable that a native population on a lost island at the end of the world needed to use the meter and that they discovered it. 
There is a straight and precise line going from the edge of the coast towards the interior. This line is pi, 3.14 kilometers. Garth Norman found the Babylonian cubit on a Moai sculpture. Perhaps we will also find the royal cubit by taking other measurements. Over the years, the Egyptians circumnavigated the world several times. Sometimes accidents occur. No, you're not dreaming. Their boats ran aground in Gosford, Australia. The 500 hieroglyphs found there are referenced. There is no error, the grammar is perfect. The Gosford hieroglyphs, as analyzed and explained by Egyptologist Mohammed Ibrahim and guide Yosef Ayan, are from ancient Egypt. Some hieroglyphs were unknown and undocumented until 2012. So now, I think an important question would be, do you think that the Gosford glyphs represent Egyptian hieroglyphs? Yes, definitely. From the first sight, from the first look, I feel it, uh, I, and you must know that uh, when we made our researches, uh, me and Yusuf, we made it separately in the beginning. He did it by himself and then we do. And then when we met, we found that uh, both of us reached the same result yeah. without contacting each other for more than two weeks. So yes, definitely it is ancient Egyptian writings. No doubt, no doubt about it. These are ancient Egyptian writings. The names of Khufu, his father Sneferu, and his son Jedefre appear in these hieroglyphs. Colin Hayter, independent researcher, does the translation. Sneferu came to Australia twice. Being protected, the ruler of Egypt, still alive, uh, still dead but still is, Khufu, her father Sneferu, Sneferu, a child of Ra. So he too was a child of God, child of Ra ruler of Egypt. Importantly here we've got round that uh, Sneferu, a child of Ra, came around to this place two times, as in the West Car Papyrus, of course, telling the same thing. Sneferu came to Australia two times. Over here, now continuing the royal lineage on, this is Ratosus, or the Hellenic name for De Jeffrey. He was the next ruler, so this is showing the royal line. This hieroglyph of De Jeffre, written precisely in this way, is not seen anywhere else in the world, only two places, here in Gosford and in Giza, in the ditch of Khufu's boat. It was discovered for the first time in 1956. This other hieroglyph also exists in only two places on Earth, Gosford and Aswan. Hayter also makes the link with the famous Westcar papyrus the magicians of the court of King Khufu. G'day Australia. Hello world. I'm Cole. Welcome to this magnificent backdrop you see behind me, the Gosford Glyphs. The names in the West Car Papyrus, Dejetful, Sneferu, Didi, Rastosis or Dejeffrey, Khufu and Sneferu, all these names written in the West Car Papyrus. All these names here on the Gosford glyphs. And when we put them both together, you'll find we have a perfect match. The one, two, three, four, five, six names and an address in the West Car Papyrus. Here they are at the Gosford glyphs. This is the story of the sailor Najed Sobed, who survived an accident where two boats capsized. 
Many of the crew members lost their lives there. But what is the official statement from Egyptologists? Do these hieroglyphs date from the time of ancient Egypt or from the 20th century? Did an expert of Egyptian hieroglyphs have fun in Australia inventing a story? Are they authentic or are they fake? No official statement has been made on this subject, neither to approve it nor to reject it. They saw Earth differently from us. In this drawing of the first Nakata dynasty, a map of the Earth is shown. The exploration of the Earth was quite advanced. The exploration of the planet also took place on the other side. For the Kailasa Temple and the Ellera Caves, the rocks were cut out with solar lenses. The temple is made in a clay mold and filled with the same basalt melted into lava. The rest of the basalt is passed into the next cave. Here is one of the largest antique statues in the world in white granite, 1,000 tons. There is no white granite in or around the hill. The same technique is deployed here as in Egypt for the statues. The Extraordinary Sigiriya. There is no original staircase from the ground to access it. The first metal staircase was installed in 1900 and it did not go all the way up. How did workers get there? And how were they able to transport the material and food? How were these notches made on the wall of the granite cliff? Huge rocks placed all around and have the most bizarre tool marks which cannot be explained. For example, look at this rock. It literally has hundreds of small cubes cut out of it. And on the top, we even have a larger cube cut out as though someone wanted to sit there. This is not just a theory. We have actual evidence in front of our eyes. Look here, we don't see individual chisel marks. We see long snake-like winding tool marks which are continuous. This tool mark reminds us of scooping ice cream out of a container. Ancient builders must have used a similar technology to scoop out granite, like ice cream. How were three million red clay bricks carried up? In Sigeria, the rock was cut on the side to give it the shape we see today. At the top of the rock, there was a step pyramid built with red sandstone bricks. A granite swimming pool was built with a throne to contemplate the unique landscape. The gardens were built with the meter, the sacred triangle, and the golden rectangle.
The entire site is oriented in the same way as in Tikal. Near the town of Gaia in India is a place called Barabar. Egyptians built the incredible granite caves here. This is how the famous Barabar caves were made. A clay mold is prepared on site. The layout is made precisely to the millimeter on the outside. Once the mold is completed, they pour the granite in lava form with the solar lenses arranged above. The granite cools and hardens. The clay is removed and the result is amazing. Perfect corners and super polished surfaces. The Egyptians left their unique imprint here, the meter. The hemisphere of the Vania cave measures three meters and five centimeters. The temples of Angkor Wat are built with the meter and aligned with the equinox. In America, they built the temples above the pyramids. It was the opposite in India. So that the wonderment makes a complete trip around the globe, here is the pyramid of Suku, which is found in northern Indonesia. Its geometry is the same as that of Khufu and Tikal. Nefru, a child of Ra, came around to this place two times. Imagine that there is an Eiffel Tower in Australia which dates from the same time as Gustav Eiffel. According to documentation, Gustav Eiffel never traveled to Australia. If we find no clue, it is legitimate to attribute the creation to Gustav Eiffel and to call it the Eiffel Tower of Australia until proven otherwise. So let's call the Badabar Caves the Egyptian Caves. So let's call this prowess Egyptian prowess. The prowess of the Afro-Egyptians seems incredible. It seems unbelievable that they could create all this around the world, that they could have traveled as well. One recognizes without hesitation their indisputable authorship, their clear, certain signature in all of their achievements, the meter. The meter, but also the sophisticated techniques for melting granite, making concrete, use of sacred geometry and the constants pi, phi, and the royal cubit. The Egyptians didn't disappear. Faced with the deterioration of the climatic conditions in Egypt, they migrated massively with their knowledge to India, where hundreds of temples were born. It would seem that the works were carried out in collaboration with the local population, given the scale of construction in Asia. In any case, the supervision and architectural design is Egyptian. The Egyptians did everything to keep their knowledge secret. The local population was not to know. Our history is written from the narrative of someone who copied from someone else's narrative and so on, which leave much to be desired about the truth of things. However, the Egyptians did not leave writings, but left their digital signature everywhere in the world. They are building with the matter. It is their genetic code. The assumption is that at this point, an apocalypse occurred, around 2100 BC. A very powerful earthquake. The continent in the middle of the Atlantic, Plato's Atlantis, sank. Gigantic tsunamis rose. In Central America, entire cities were swept by the waves in minutes. The whole of Egypt was brought down by this tremor, which caused the granite coverings to fall off of the Menkor Pyramid. 
The Impur papyrus describes an apocalyptic landscape. All good things are gone. There is not one black fingernail left. The plague hit the whole country. There is blood everywhere. The river is blood. The country is without light. All over Earth, the remains collapsed except the most massive. The whole planet was shaken. Ocean levels rose. Coastal towns were overwhelmed by the waters in a few days. Civilizations recovered slowly from this cataclysm. Thales of Miletus, Pythagoras, Plato, Solon, Archimedes, Hippocrates, and hundreds of others stayed for 15 or 20 years in Egypt, not like tourists on vacation, but to acquire knowledge in the land of light. They went home with a few crumbs of knowledge that they taught when they returned to Greece. Let us remember, the Egyptian priests fooled Herodotus concerning the construction of the pyramid with cranes. The Greeks extracted from the Egyptians some formulas on concrete manufacturing and some architectural bases to build their first temple. The architecture of the Temple of Djoser built 2400 years earlier was faithfully copied by the Greeks. The Athena Temple, the Parthenon, and Erechtheon were made of limestone concrete. The marble was also cast and not cut. This process was copied later by the Romans. But that was not enough for them, because the Egyptian savants did not reveal much. It was becoming crucial for the Greeks to get their hands on Egypt. All united around Alexander of Macedonia, the Greeks left to invade Egypt. After Alexander defeated the Persians in Granicus, his primary objective was to invade. No, Egypt. For the Greeks, Alexander deserved his name, the Great. After his death, his best friend Ptolemy settled in Egypt as king and never again returned in Greece. It's as if the head of the village became the head of Silicon Valley overnight. Such were Greece and Egypt at that time. His children, his grandchildren, entire Ptolemaic dynasties reigned in Egypt. Certainly, the Greeks would not have chosen to settle in the Third World. The Romans took their turn at seizing this knowledge, built their cities and their empire. We hear about cement and Roman concrete, but before being Roman, this concrete was Egyptian. Hundreds of Roman temples were quickly erected all around the Mediterranean Sea. The construction of the Colosseum lasted 10 years. To the west, the Roman Forum was completed in eight years. It would have taken at least 200 years to build them out of carved stones. We know how to recognize a poured stone thanks to the insertion of an object which has no place being there, as in the example of the Pyramid of Medum. Lugdunum, now known as Lyon, there is ancient theater built during the reign of Augustus. On this site we see granite, limestone, and andesite blocks. They are arranged in a precise way like in Cusco and like in Egypt, where a sheet of paper could not be slipped between them. These are amalgamated ores and poured in geopolymer concrete. At the very back, we find stones of the building containing pieces of iron. They were incorporated while the concrete was still fresh. The Greeks used a similar technique. They incorporated an iron frame to reinforce the concrete. Here is Baalbek, whose immense stones cause so much ink to flow. These famous stones do not belong to distant ancient civilizations. The Baalbek stones are part of the temple. They were poured on site by the Romans, like the rest of the temple. They were neither cut nor moved. 600 meters below is the stone of the pregnant woman. Below and next to it are two other stones of the same size in limestone concrete. These are the foundation of a new temple in continuation of Baalbek. But this project was abandoned. It is the work of the Greco-Romans and not that of a civilization which disappeared 12,000 years ago. The entire Roman Empire was built of limestone concrete. The Egyptians' technique to melt granite remained secret to the general public. Like all the rest of the empire, Egypt was plundered in its turn. After the conquest of Egypt, many Egyptian obelisks were taken to Europe, mainly in Rome. Later, ignoring the significance of the stories carved on obelisks, they added their crosses. The tools to extract and grind the minerals were enhanced and performed better and better. The Order of the Knights Templar, called the Guardians of the Temple, was actually an order of concrete temple builders. They gave themselves over to the church after being massacred in 1312. 
Requests to make churches, theaters, cultural centers, buildings, public and private, continued to grow. The financial stakes were enormous. Many concrete construction companies were born all over Europe. They were called the Freemason in England, and in France, the Francs-Maçons, the Compagnon de Devoir, and others, the Maître Comencini. Over the centuries, they came together to form a single international body, the Freemasons. They enacted a sacred rule. The plans, the information, the archives of each building will be kept secret, hidden from the general public. They invented the legend of carving stone for the average person, common mortals. Extracting the minerals to make concrete became easier. The composition of the mixtures improved, and the limestone extraction process, grinding, lime manufacturing, was gradually industrialized. The church, therefore the Vatican, placed orders to make basilicas and cathedrals, and the Freemasons built them out of concrete. Everyone wins. The church propagated the legend of the carved stone made from the suffering and sweat of the faithful. Thousands of faithful Catholics carried by their immense faith who cut stones for the glory of the Holy Church. When we visit these monuments, we are both amazed but also doubtful, with a feeling that something is wrong. In fact, the builders did not suffer as much by cutting stones as you might imagine. They were not the faithful of the church that built them, but rather specialized and organized teams, masters of architecture and concrete. The Freemasons poured concrete not only for the church, but also for the kings, dukes, counts, for different kingdoms, big and small, and all kinds of buildings. The most important sponsor at the time was the Vatican. Another way to distinguish a cut stone from a cast stone is the imprint of tissue. Some masons used linen fabrics so that the concrete could be easily detached from the formwork mold. These imprints are found in all buildings. These marks are visible on the first row, that is to say, the first stones laid at the start of the construction. Sometimes they mixed shells in the concrete, like the ancient Egyptians. Concrete flowed freely all over Europe and around the world. It is enough to observe the first foundations of the buildings to understand that there never were cut stones. Egyptian concrete was not only used for churches, but for all infrastructure. From 1700 to 1900, hundreds of cathedrals were built, thousands of bridges, public and private buildings in all European cities. The Basilica of Notre Dame de Fouvrière in Lyon is an example of different mixtures. We find here all kinds of concrete. Even the granite is poured. Don't go looking. There is no document on its construction. The tourist book explicitly says that the basilica is made of pierre de taille. Pierre de taille, large stones. Pierre taillé, carved stones. A subtle difference in French leaves room for confusion. There is no photo showing the stones being transported or lifted. We are in the real estate and concrete era. But at the same time, it is important to uphold the myth of cut stone. Freemasons have kept this secret for hundreds of years. One last visit. I heard that the Clermont-Fern Cathedral was built with cut black volcanic stone from the surrounding area. I went there. After a quick examination, I found that this stone had also been poured. I observed the first row. Fabric and prints. Everything was poured. I decided to stop looking for cut stone. There aren't any. Certainly, the cathedral is undoubtedly built in stone, but they are artificial stones and not carved stones. This is the true story of the philosopher's stone, which we so often hear about. The human being replaces nature by effortlessly creating stones which express the complexity of chemistry and reveal universal dimensions, knowledge kept and discreetly transmitted. The use of sacred geometry in construction from Egyptian knowledge was preserved and transmitted in secret. Only a few initiated architects had the privilege of accessing it. Masons applied sacred architecture and Egyptian thought by integrating universal constants in all buildings. The architects of the cathedrals deployed the meter, pi, the golden ratio, and the royal cubit. If we take measurements in churches and cathedrals, we find these units everywhere. To conclude, 
the Freemasons were never stonemasons, but a body of builders, architects, chemists, and mathematicians who used concrete. Even today, Negro Egypt continues to be discreetly honored by the Freemasons in thanks for the immense gift received from them. Besides, the Freemasons paid tribute to the Egyptians and Africans by contributing to the abolition of one of the most shameful practices of humanity, maintained by kings and the church for centuries, slavery. They helped black Africa to raise their heads little by little. This is not a coincidence. It is indeed the blueprint of the Amu Re Temple in Luxor, replicated with loyalty in the Louvre and the Tuileries Garden in the heart of Paris. Why did the Egyptian civilization disappear? They didn't disappear, but some migrated to India for a milder climate. Those who stayed behind kept their knowledge secret, but their pacifism was fatal. They had not developed a powerful army. All those who visited Egypt left dazzled by the land of light. Over the centuries, the knowledge of Imhotep and the Egyptians escaped and spread throughout the entire world. Their knowledge was not lost, it was shared, sometimes taken by force by the Persians, the Greeks, the Philistines, the Romans, the whole world. It was passed on from generation to generation. For almost 3,000 years, Imhotep was worshipped as a god. Pilgrims came every year from all over the world until the year 350, the date when Constantine decided to convert the whole empire to Christianity. From that time on, the temples dedicated to the prophet Imhotep were destroyed and the priests slaughtered. Ancient pagan and Egyptian beliefs were all erased. Imhotep was replaced by Jesus Christ and was forgotten. The Imhotep Treaty was replaced by the Hippocratic Oath. Afro-Egyptians were seen as gods by the people they encountered. We now realize who these aliens and gods are. They were the first scientists of humanity, the fathers of chemistry, physics, math, and geometry. The Egyptians founded modern civilization. The Nile was doubly sacred. It offered food, but not only. The Nile gave them the most precious thing in the world, the time. Time, four months per year to reflect and observe. Time for science. What is science? What is the definition of science itself? Science is experimental, verifiable, and visible. Thousands of books were written, each proposing a hypothesis to exclude the Egyptians and put in place an extraterrestrial civilization. Atlanteans, missing astronauts or slaves, that's fiction, fantasy, not science. There is no evidence to prove the existence of the aliens. Without playing with words, with semantics, without philosophizing, the fact of not having scientific evidence is already proof. For thousands of years, we have been alone on Earth, and we will remain so for a long time, alone, facing ourselves. These theorists, who advanced ignorance and obscurantism, now belong to the dustbin of history. The dustbin of history is there to store these books and these theories. Above all, not to make them disappear so that humanity can form its own opinion. To believe that development and human intelligence came from elsewhere is beautiful. It's romantic. We don't want to be alone in the universe, but it's not the truth. A myth disappears, and more precisely, that of an unknown civilization. The truth is, that this mysterious and greatly developed civilization was Egypt. If there is an obscured truth, it is that this Egypt was Negro. They discovered solar energy. Without solar energy, there would have been no Great Pyramid. Afro-Egyptians discovered that the Earth was round, and they were the first to have traveled and explore it up and down. Whenever a civilization was brought into contact with Egypt, temples arose and that civilization was propelled forward. A myth was born, that of cut stone. Humanity was built with all forms of concrete and not with cut stone. The ancient history of Egypt, Africa, Asia, and America must be fully rewritten.
Before Michelangelo's sculptures, there was Egyptian perfection. Tell me again about the Mona Lisa's mysterious smile. I say, look instead at the enigmatic smile of Ramses II. Are you looking for Atlanteans? Here they are. They are in Egypt. With chemistry and physics, math and geometry in tandem, Negro Egypt allowed us to build temples, streets, houses, sports stadiums, enough to build humanity. They laid the pillars of science, the first alphabet, art, philosophy, medicine, and religions. They are at the origin of the cultures of the world. They created the cultures of the world. That is the greatest mystery of humanity. Wherever they settled, they built a temple and later a city was born. Let's ask the right question. Should we put an end to the mystery of the pyramids maintained by some Egyptologists? Egypt has an important task, that of preserving the cradle of humanity. It is the duty of all countries to help, because if you do not have a past, you will not have a future. Imhotep was the greatest scientist of humanity, and the Negroes of Africa gave their knowledge, chemistry, architecture, geometry, mathematics, to all other peoples. And in return, what did they receive as a reward? Centuries of slavery, suffering, misery, massacres, and it never ends. The looting and insult to Africa continue today. What if we finally all share our riches? It's time for humanity to mature.